Yes, I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. A collection of advanced self-help quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago, as I understand it, was referred to by some as philosophical medicine or narrative medicine, helping one to find their story. If you see me looking around sometimes, I'm in a public place, sometimes I get distracted, that kind of thing. Uh, I've been doing these videos in public for the past little while here. Uh, restaurants, coffee shops, hotel lobbies, that kind of thing. Um, so um, I'm on the lookout for a nice uh, kind of a you know meeting room I can use uh, where I can do the videos kind of you know straightly kind of thing. Let's begin with my disclaimer right off the bat here. I'm not a shrink. I'm not a professor, a social worker, midwife, doula, nutritionist, gynecologist. Uh, you know I don't have a master's degree even. Uh, I, I'm I have a BA, that's about it, unfortunately. Uh, I'm the compiler of these quotes. Okay, these 10,000 quotes that we have in our collection now, 10,000 advanced self-help quotes uh, taken um, from this Know Thyself uh, narrative medicine feeling approach, where if we know our story, uh, we know ourselves, we're connected to ourselves, we make sense and love life in the present, all is good kind of thing. And we're sort of in our normal place normal place being we have connection and we're we're at home with them meaning we feel our existential real self which animates uh, through us and there's like a sense of uh, having an ontological self I feel therefore I am this self like a being kind of self I feel therefore I am and this is the, the natural state of affairs a normal development if the child feels safe um, he hatches out of the, the original mesh that, that the mother and the baby have in terms of psychology and identity. At four to five months, it feels safe. It starts to hatch out out of that mesh. The child's sense of self kind of um, metaphorically hatches out of the egg kind of thing. So it sort of consolidates out of that previous condition of blurredness of the two. The child needs to feel safe for that. It's a gradual hatching process from four to five months to 18 months as discussed in uh, many of the videos uh, we've covered so far. So we now have 1,000 uh, videos in this collection here. And, uh, and one, um, one, uh, your mission, should you choose to accept it, uh, to paraphrase Robert Bly, Robert Bly, a guest mentor in our collection, is to read psychology every day for 10 minutes. Forgive it for its jargon, the study of the soul, in psychology every day for 10 minutes, and pluck out one quote, uh, uh, make a note of it, write it down kind of thing, and then ask yourself, uh, what does this quote remind me of? Or why did I choose this quote? Or how do I feel about this quote? Or just free associate by it. That kind of do something with it kind of thing. Just add a little bit to it. And don't no pressure, just a little bit by little bit. And you do that every day. So in each video we have we on average have about ten quotes uh, on average uh, per video. And then uh, that sort of fits Robert Bly's advice. So one could go to these 1,000 videos. Uh, one a day for three years and have their own customized, personalized uh, for them, their own personalized, customized, tailored for them, 1001 windmills of the mind. It's like a basket of knowledge, like a nest of knowledge that creates the conditions for the feelings to come in. So the, the, in, the cognitive insights are first there, then it leads to the emotional knowing. Psychoanalysis looks for an egg in a basket that's missing. So first weave the basket, then the egg, the potential, the emotional knowing, the feeling can come back. And, um, so uh, these, uh, these quotes are an attempt to build this basket kind of thing. Just as a bird builds a nest, uh, then, then, then there can be an egg. Well, likewise, we want to build this kind of nest of uh, ideas, constructs, theories, ballpark approximations, guesstimates, hypotheses, invitations for mutual exploration, clues, yeah, we're trying to be a detective here, so these quotes, these 10,000 quotes are helping us to be our own psychological detective, existential detective, know thyself, explore, the emotional detective, and so on, right? Um, these quotes are giving us night vision. There's a lot of us which we don't know. It's considered unknown. The metaphor, it's dark, shadow in the forest, dark in there. We don't see what's going on. Well, these quotes give us a lantern. These quotes give us some night vision to identify our lost, repressed, denied, uh, undeveloped real self that didn't get a chance to uh, develop with childhood trauma and then it was submerged uh, in, into the forest. So one fairy tale is entitled, Go I Know Not Whither and Bring Back I Know Not What. So what are we talking about? What, what, what are we talking about? 
So the, child, the word of the year by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Company for last year, 2023, was authentic. So we're all born with an authentic self, a real self. It's not fully blossomed yet, it's kind of emerging, but it's there. It's our, it's, um, it means uh, we feel real and alive with him, and we have a wide range of feelings, needed feelings, appropriate feelings, alive, like the radiance, like the sun. So the metaphors like the sun, uh, the golden ball, like the sun, our feelings kind of radiate. The joy is sort of the main animating emotion with uh, natural development, and, uh, and, and we, have, we feel a sense of self at home with him. I feel therefore I am, kind of thing. So that's there, we all have it in the beginning, assuming the baby isn't kind of traumatized in the uterus or traumatized at birth or something, assuming uh, he kind of has that. But uh, when he's born, he needs uh, a kind of a process. Um, the first part of it is, is called an extended blissful oneness with the mother, an extended social interpersonal womb, and an extended paradise. Babies can't have paradise lost at biological birth. They need that kind of blissful oneness with the mother, that mother-infant dual unity, that symbiosis, merging, fusion. Okay, that, that's got to continue, they say, for the first four to five months. So the role of the mother, uh, in particular, is that when the baby comes out, she provides that safe, that rhythm of safety, that positive maternal experience, the holding environment, her soothing, her reverie, her presence, her tenderness, her affection, her warmth, her acceptance, delight, you know, her, uh, you know, um, feeling, allowing herself to let the child feel at one, one with her, uh, allowing the child to think that the child owns her, actually. Let the child think that the mother's his, that belongs to him, and everything about the mother's for him, serves him. It's, it's primary narcissism. So l allow the mother, uh, the mother allows herself to be what they call a symbiotic object, a self-object for the baby. Never in any moment should the mother turn her around and somehow use the baby to meet her needs in any way. Okay, that's trauma right there, once it's turned like that. Not at all. Um, the, the, the jargon for that is when the mother uh, does try to meet her needs using the baby to meet her needs, that's called the Jocasta style of mother, the Jocasta. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the mind, the child's sense of self that's one with the mother doesn't get a chance to separate. So it's fused like that. That's called the Jocasta style of mother. So the metaphors are still kind of one like that, like a wedding. The child didn't want that. So don't be confused by how people tell that story, Jocasta, Elias, Electra, Oedipus, that dysfunctional family. It's a metaphor for inner dynamics. So myths and fairy tales are true on the inside, not on the outside. Myths and fairy tales are metaphors for inner dynamics. They're, they're true on the inside, not on the outside. So that Oedipus story just means simply that all babies need to feel safe with the mother to hatch out and leave her psychologically. We're not talking about living under the same condo roof or whatever. So um, that's all that means. So, it, so the Oedipus complex means like the mother complex, means a child, if it's a son or a daughter, if they don't feel safe with the mother, they don't have the strength or identity or knowledge or trust or anything about themselves to have to have as themselves to be themselves. They need to, they need to be kind of fed and, and nourished and, and feel safe and takes time for the, you know four to five months in, in the beginning. Then they can start to hatch out. If the mother's shaming the baby, using the baby, the bottle, schedule, force feeding, rough handling, not being around, maybe resents the idea of being a mother, maybe didn't want to be a mother at that time, or maybe shames her own baby because she wanted to say that she was shamed, and how can she love if she never got loved? Oh, cunning tale. Or maybe the mother actually, sometimes some mothers actually transfer their frustrating mother into the baby and now have talionic feelings towards their own baby, thinking the baby's their mother. Oh, cunning tale. So that child's not getting loved. So that child's gonna end up with a mother complex. Okay, if, if, if it's a boy, they call it the Oedipus complex or the mother complex. If it's a daughter, they call it the Electra complex. So the Electra, so Electra was Oedipus's sister, brother and sister kind of team. It's not an outer story that people keep talking. It's nothing to do outwardly. It's not concretely real on the outside. It's a metaphor for inner dynamics. So the inner dynamic is the child's sense of self. It is blurred in with the sense of the mother. So that's like a matter, that's like a union, like a marriage like that. No child wanted that. If anything, uh, that story means um, that maybe the mother wanted it, and the child stuck like that. So the storyteller would say, well, they got married or something, but it's an inner, it's an inner thing. It's a pathological negative union. It's not like a healthy uh, kind of thing. Um, now, myths and fairy tales do, t do have like a positive marriage metaphor, but that's not, that's not in this case here. 
Um, I'm, and there's no father around, meaning um, there, there wasn't any kind of um, consciousness or active uh, so-called mentalizing by the mother or some kind of the mother being having soul vision for the child. That's like an active kind of thing. So there's no like quote-unquote fatherly kind of place like that, right? Or, or in development, if the father's around, it might help the child to uh, ease the transition uh, out of the mother to connect with the father. But not, but not use the father as a substitute for the mother, because then you're just recreating the problem with the mother onto the father. That's not it, either. That's that's also problematic. So I think that image of the the story when they say the father's not around or absent, uh, that that just means uh, that the mother somehow wasn't, didn't have soul vision for the child, didn't have a kind of empathy or recognition for the child. Why? Because when a mother's in pain herself, her perceptual apparatus diminishes. And she can only, because her need, her old unfulfilled need, okay, from long ago, that need was, was so unmet, and there's so much pain around it, that's all she sees. That's all she sees. If all she sees is um, her need um, to be taken care of, as, if that's all she sees and has a baby, she might not see the reality of the baby as a person in their own right. All she sees is an opportunity to use the baby to comfort her, soothe her. So she parentifies the baby. It, again, that's such a cost of conflict. Oh, you're gonna see me. Yeah, sorry, like, uh, yeah, you know, I walk here, um, it's been like almost an hour, to, like I'm drenched in soap by the time I get here. It's a nice place, it's worth making the trip and all that. Um, but unfortunately, uh, uh, the flies have noticed uh, <laughs> that, that I'm kind of hot here. So yeah, sorry about some little, some little distractions here. I want to get these quotes out here. These are important quotes, the valuable quotes. Um, many of these quotes you won't even actually find. They haven't been digitized. They come from rare printed books, psychology books that haven't been digitized. Uh, and a lot of books uh, which for a while were digitized, I noticed personally they're being removed. Like, oh, I can't believe it. Like, uh, like James F. Masterson, one of our mentors, all of his books have been removed. And a lot of um, a lot of psychology books, like uh, in the psychoanalytic tradition, um, most of them, from what I can tell, are being removed like crazy. Like what the, what the, oh my God, this, this, psycho, this psychoanalysis, um, it helps us to see patterns, it helps us to see how, we're rec how we are recreating the problem in the past, in the present, with the fantasy to change the past, and how, and how, that, how dysfunctional that is, because the present it's only a metaphor of the past, it's not the real past. So if we can see that we're doing it, we can stop it, and and um, and that, that, that's a pregnant virgin motif. Now there's a potential for new existence life. So the death of unreal hope uh, is the birth of new life. So psychoanalysis um, works towards helping you to make inferences, right? You make inferences. So there's a problem with the mother in the nursery. That's, that's uh, the needs are unmet. The child has a need for a secure attachment style. That's a basic pro, uh, raw primal need for the baby, to have what's called a secure attachment style. That secure attachment style has five parts. Um, hold on a sec. Yeah, I'm right. This, this spot is sort of the maximum distance away from the other guests, um, so I don't want to um, disturb anyone. But I'm right at the parking lot in the main entrance, so you might see me in this background. I had to wait a while for uh, this group near me that was a really loud group just behind me. So when they finally left, I started the video. There's another group back there, but I, just, I don't really hear them. So they don't hear me now. It's a Saturday, so it's a little busier around here. Um, yeah, so a lot of these, uh, a lot of these quotes, um, you know, actually, like, like at the moment, um, our, our, the topic that we're currently doing is the famous BPD topic. And we did post a few quotes about three years ago, and I kind of left it alone. So I've just I recently came across a self-help book uh, called Understanding Borderline Mothers. So in the past couple of videos, I posted some quotes from that self-help book uh, by the author Christine Lawson, I think. Uh, just a typical self-help kind of thing. But it served as sort of a prompt uh, to maybe look into the topic further, which we'll do in this video here. So this will be uh, 2790. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, add some uh, interesting 
uh, points about the, the famous BPD, a phenomena, pattern, psychology, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we'll talk about Grothstein's theory. And, um, and a few others, yeah, let's see. Let's see. Oh yeah, it's coming up, yeah, okay. Yeah, these, yeah, so here it is here. Okay, so we'll, in this video we'll be doing uh, the, the, this one here. So I said there are usually 10, you know, sometimes there's longer. Uh, sometimes they're longer. Like for example here, yeah, okay, let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Oh, there's 20 here. Look at that, eh? So once in a while we, we have like more than 10. Sometimes there's only one or two, so on average there's 10 quotes. So in this video, we'll be doing 20 quotes on the topic of the BPD pattern as a, as a continuation of the previous material uh, by, Miss, uh, by Miss Lawson there. She talks about the four types of uh, BPD uh, patterns, the waif, the hermit, uh, the bully she calls the queen, and the witch one. Um, so. But it's you know it's kind of vague and overlapping. So in this video it's, it's a little better. It's, it's, it's there. I, I think I think you like I think uh, I, I like these uh, I, I like these I like the quotes that are coming up in this video. So stay tuned. Uh, we got some good quotes coming. The key one is from Grotstein. Actually, there's two here. The, the one from Grotstein and uh, Judd and McGlashan. Those two guys. I think those are the key ones there. So yeah, so stay tuned for that. It'll, it'll, it'll give you empathy, it'll give you a little understanding and appreciation of how BPD is sort of uh, a form of PTSD. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that topic uh, in a minute. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, th these, uh, these are exciting quotes. There's nothing like it out there at all. Um, I've plucked out um, what I believe to be the best, uh, the greatest hits um, of psychoanalysis from what I could find up, to, up until this point. And the beauty of, it, of these quotes is that they're clear. Uh, if they're clear for me, I only have a BA, so if they're clear for me, and my BA isn't from a high level university, it's from a basic, a very basic one. So if they're clear for me, uh, they're going to be clear, I think, for everybody. Um, as best as I can find, as best as I can see these quotes to be, they fit Grice's criteria for communication. Okay, so relevance. Are they, are they relevant to the topic of healing your soul? Okay, giving a night vision, building a basket. Um, you know, are, are they relevant to helping you know yourself? Are they helping you, are they relevant to helping you to build a bridge to make the unconscious conscious? To help you uh, identify patterns and uh, see how maybe what you're doing in the present is some kind of communication of what happened in the past. Maybe it's, it's an expression of your anger of what happened in the past. Maybe it's an expression of your hope and wishes of what you needed back in the past. So these quotes are sort of relevant um, to help us find our story. Okay, we're looking for narrative medicine. The more we have narr narrative medicine, the more we can know about our unknown self. So we have an unknown self, a secret self. A sh so this real self that we were talking about before, the child had an authentic self. Now if the child's needs don't get met, okay, if he doesn't get a secure attachment stuff, okay, so then, okay, then the child does a desperate emergency kind of thing. He takes his authentic self and wants to protect us somehow. So he takes his authentic self, which hasn't even blossomed yet. It hasn't even fully developed yet. It's kind of like budding. It was just starting kind of thing. And the mother's hurting him. What does he do to his real self? Okay, okay. well, he can uh, put it into cold storage for number one. That's called emotional. So the emotionality, the effect is um, that um, the emotionality is emotional coma, emotional hypothermia, emotional catatonia. So he's trying to like freeze it up, so to speak, and put it like in a block of ice and put in put it in the Siberia or something, or, or the Arctic tongue. So there's an image of the woolly mammoth in Siberia, apparently. So that's one image of what the child does uh, to protect his authentic self. 
he puts it far away in some other place and puts it in a block of ice. That's just a metaphor for how we feel. So that in myths and fairy tales, uh, when something becomes frozen, petrified, or turned to stone, i.e. becomes a statue, uh, that's, that's a common uh, phenomenon of what the child, of what happens to the child's real self. Now, we live to the extent that we are connected to our real self, because with the real self, we have our real feelings. Do we live to the extent that we feel, says Karen Horney, one of our mentors, if you don't have your real self, you're not really gonna have your feelings there. Oh yes, you'll have the, the visceral sensations of the survival brain response, uh, because you lost your real self. But the quote unquote more human side of being human, joy, pleasure, and so on. Um, in the Disney film Inside Out, that's when joy and sadness got zooped away and then anger appeared. Okay. So we, we have a, let's pause for a sec. That Disney film Inside Out is an excellent, quick, uh, immediate, uh, important visual there. We have three brains, the famous triune brain, the three in one brain. We have three brains. Here, the, new, the, the newest brain, the, the neocortex. Okay, that, so it lets us be aware of ourselves and we can do math and speak and understand and talk and all this. That's, that's the new brain, right? The second brain, that's mainly us in terms of feelings from the body. Okay, that's the, like the body brain kind of thing. Okay, that's like the feeling brain. So we feel mainly from that second one. The third one it makes us aware of it all. The, the third brain makes us aware of the previous two brains. Right? And then the first brain, uh, that's mainly like the old, old, ancient uh, brain. Uh, that's, they call the survival brain. Um, your, your spine and the tip of the brain stem and the amygdala, like the stress response. There's no real feelings or, or family or, or love there. It's just the survival response, right? So we have three brains, right? The survival brain, it, it's about, it's about sensations and visceral so anger and fear kind of come from there although we say although we refer, we refer to anger and fear as emotions and feelings uh, technically technically people are saying it's not really sort of like a feeling in the sense of uh, being connected to your home your inner home it's a feeling it, it's the sensations of the survival brain the fear and anger it's a stress response right so it's a stress response this will biological, neurochemicals, cortisol, adrenaline. It's quite, kind of in that biological area. Um, so when joy and sadness representing, I feel there for amnes, our feeling self, our golden ball, the more human side of being human, um, where joy runs the console, okay, in normal development, joy runs the console, the serene, inexhaustible fullness of being. So you have your beings, the joy, the pleasure, serene, calm, joy, okay? And when joy and sadness got zooped away, okay, then, then there's a real anger about that, so there, that's why anger is at the console. And um, so, uh, if we lose our real self, um, you see, who are we? We feel empty or something. So that now the survival brain comes in and says, "Well, get back your real self. We're, we're born to have our authentic self," kind of thing. So if the mother shames the baby and he loses his real self, he's going to be angry, kind of thing. Anger means that the baby didn't get a secure attachment style. So we have three brains, the first brain, the second brain, the third brain, right? Um, colloquially, colloquially um, informally, people might say uh, the, the crocodile brain, uh, the chimpanzee brain, and the human brain, right? Or the thinking cap, right? So the reptile brain, the puppy brain, and think, thinking cap. Just to talk about the brains. And, and the crocodile brain is more about it's, right, survival, instinct, survival, reproduction, it's cold. Um, get like that. It's, it doesn't think about your feelings or their feelings. It's just about survival. It's just the visceral response, of the stress response, okay, of uh, fear and anger. Um, now that stress response is because the person lost, is being shamed by the mother, and the child had to lose his identity. Like, oh my God, what's the mother doing here? So now anger, now anger is appearing because anger is going to make the child. Uh, want to control the mother, possess the mother, bite the mother's nipple to control her, to tell her, come on, be, be a reliable mother, don't withdraw, don't follow some schedule here, I'm, I'm hungry here, don't follow some schedule in a magazine book that says uh, follow some schedule, no, no, follow my needs, I, I, know, I know if I'm hungry, the magazine printout doesn't know what, what I'm hungry, when I'm hungry or not hungry, 
follow, follow me, mother. Like, so I have needs and be attuned to me, be connected to me. I trust you, don't betray me to some magazine article. So then he's gonna be kind of angry like that. So then if the anger's, the, so anger's uh, meaning he hopes he can control the breast. Uh, maybe he, he's so angry and so enraged, he, he fantasizes, fantasizes that he's gonna gobble with oral greed. Now he enters into oral greed because his needs are mad, turns to oral greed and he's enraged. He, he's gonna feel like a hungry wolf wishing to devour the breast. That's too much excitation because they're fused. He says the mother's a hungry wolf. Like what's going on here? So there's a lot, lot of problems with this. So we don't want, babies shouldn't be angry. Like babies shouldn't feel us in danger of their life kind of thing. Because that memory goes into that first brain. It's a, it's a memories are relational. Memories are relational, self and the other blurred in, in that first brain. Now it's recorded, but we don't remember it. It goes into the first brain. That's called repression. Okay. Emily Dickinson describes trauma as follows. There's a pain so utter, it swallows substance up. So his authentic self, his, his core substance, kind of got swallowed up kind of thing. That means it went down. So first brain, second brain, third brain, pressed down. It went down, like swallowed up kind of thing. And then that's a pain, then the mercy, okay, then the swoon. She talks about the swoon, meaning, meaning the brain is going to release endorphins to numb the pain. So he's in pain, but he's not aware of it because of the mercy chemical called endorphins that numb the pain. Now he's going through, now he's going through life in a swoon, in a trance, sleepwalking through life, going through the emotions life, feeling that he's living the undive life, the provisional life. When does life begin kind of thing? Something's missing and so on. So he, So back to the Disney film. When Joy and Sadness got zooped away, Joy and Sadness, those two characters, they sort of represent the, the, main, the main normal feelings of, of, of personhood, of being a person. Okay, we have a body and there's feelings there. And, that's, and our, we live to the extent that we feel. So the main feeling is pleasure, like joy of existence. I feel therefore I am. And yes, joy can step aside, let sadness run the console when there are losses, so it can do that. That's actually, um, pleasure, it's not, um, the pain is one we're not feeling. We may feel sad, but it's not necessarily painful. Pain means we don't feel. When you feel, you're not really, you're not really in pain when you don't feel. Sorry. Uh, when you feel, you're not in pain. When you don't feel, then you're in pain. So sadness is okay. It's a natural response to loss, um, right? And then when you admit a loss and kind of go through like the five stages of grief kind of thing. Um, then, then, then sadness can step aside and joy comes back to the console. Joy runs the console. Again, the Disney film inside of the metaphor running the console there in, in that film. Now when joy and sadness are zooped away, okay, um, then um, the identity is missing, the real self is missing, the authentic self is missing. Who is he? Where is he? He's not going to make it. So now, now the survival brain, now you go back, like you regress back to the primitive, archaic uh, survival brain, okay, the, the, the amygdala and the brainstem, and that's visceral sensations of fear and anger. So we saw that in Disney film, Fear and Anger. Huh? Now fear easily gets overwhelmed. If the baby's being abused by his mother, uh, the baby, kind of his first response would be, this is scary here, uh, get out of here, flee, run. Uh, but where's the baby going to go? Where's he, where's he, how is he going to flee or flight? Where's he going to go? Um, he's kind of cornered, so to speak. So all, so then finally, um, he's like so-called back in the corner, so to speak. Then all the energy is revved up and he can't flee, can't flee, he's cornered, can't flee, all the energy. And then, then finally the most uh, drastic measure is he's in now anger appears. So we saw anger sort of mainly at the console. And, uh, so anger just cares about survival, there's no feelings, it's, it's uh, that kind of thing. So when, when we get back our identity uh, through some kind of forgiveness process, um, then, then fear and anger can step aside and joy can run the console. Or, let, or sadness can be, or, or the wide range, a uh, whole host of, actually that guy, I remember him saying, 
what's his name, Doctor, Pete Doctor, the guy who made that film inside out, he, he said he wanted to have a whole bunch of feelings uh, at the console, like, um, like not just fear and anger, he wanted like have a dozen or 20 or 30 feelings, he wanted to have like a whole assortment there, so there's a whole assortment of feelings there, that's sort of the main, you know, interest and curiosity and, and creativity and spontaneity and play and delight and uh, sharing the pleasure of that and um, just, uh, you know, like, uh, like fun play, like, uh, you know, like, uh, like on you, you know, you see little short video clips, um, you know, like of, of, of pets playing and all this. And, um, so that kind of like fun kind of uh, togetherness kind of play, community kind of play. And he wanted to have a whole kind of a uh, uh, cast of characters there. I was mentioning in the recent, yeah, I mentioned the last or two videos ago, a couple of clips like that. I saw one, um, a fun clip about a family on a ski hill in, in reference to play here. Um, the, the family, um, they were at the top of the hill and the adults were um, kind of skiing down and the kids were sort of on the side, there was like a smaller hill and the, the kids were kind of tobogganing down the smaller hill and the pet dog, the, what was he, a golden retriever or something like that? Yeah, I think it was a golden retriever. Um, he was at the top there and wanting to join in and play and, ha and join in the family fun kind of thing. And you can see the dog, they were filming him, and you can see the dog kind of like, hey, come on guys, uh, what about me? Um, but the dog doesn't have skis, the dog doesn't have a toboggan, and you can see him kind of shaking and looking around and figuring out how's he going to join them. And he's like, he's like turning his, he's kind of like twisting, it. he's like turning his head left and right and shaking around, moving around, trying to, you can see him kind of thinking, how's, how's this going to work? How's, <laughs> so finally, um, finally you saw him uh, decide to tilt to the side kind of thing and he managed to kind of like use his whole he figured he, he could use his whole body like as if it were toboggan and sure enough whoosh he slid he slid down the hill uh, the smaller hill um, with his whole body and you can see <laughs> he was so eager to play and join in with the family kind of thing another fun clip I like was uh, that, that there was some kind of obstacle course some dog was uh, I think it was a border collie. He was trained um, to, to do some kind of obstacle, like a gymnast or something. And um, I guess it was like, like a competition of some kind. I don't know. But he, he didn't know. It, he didn't care about that. He was, he was um, doing hurdles. So there was this one dog who was um, like Flash, Flash dog, like Flash, the, the superhero Flash. He was like really quickly. He was so excited, so happy to play this game of jumping through the hoops, doing zigzags, going through the tunnel, uh, turning around, flipping around, uh, do, doing these kind of more hoops and, and more, more zigzags. And um, He was doing this whole obs massive obstacle course here as quick as possible. And you can see him excited, he was wagging his tail, he was so happy. Um, he did the whole routine uh, very quickly and, and the final... The final uh, uh, the final moment was uh, uh, at the end of the routine uh, when he ran through the whole thing. He flew, like he jumped up, you know, five feet in the air, uh, diving uh, into the trainer's arms, and the trainer caught him. And, and you know, oh, good dog, good. <laughs> but the dog was having fun. He he, he was playing uh, the obstacle course with the trainer, kind of thing. Um, and we and there's a lot there's a lot of like a lot of uh, clips of seeing our pets play and all this. And, a lot of affection like this. So affection is there, tenderness, trust, play. So the more more human side of being human. So when joy and sadness representing all that, not just the two, but the whole, including the play and, and, and fun and affection and tenderness. And tenderness is there. And trust is there. The ability to make an I statement. The ability to intimacy, share and, and share your feelings. And this happened, I felt this, I want to talk about it. I can, so this uh, community and caring and I like that kind. Of, now, when that's all missing, when joy and silence got zooped away, now you're back in the anger place. It's Italianic, it's Italianic, it's, um, it's, the, it's the main emotions are hate, greed, envy, spite, vindictiveness, shadow for them. It's like so-called witch energy, uh, to use Miss Lawson's uh, thing there, it's like a witch uh, kind of mode, you know, like a, meaning malice and vengeance and all this. Envy is very pronounced, and the slogan is survival. Um, and it's the jungle slogans, the survival slogans. So, so because 
if a person's operating from that trauma place within, that's why they don't regret, they don't feel any gratitude or may, or admit a, a mistake or have an apology or um, or realize the effects that what they're doing is hurting others because they're in survival mode. They can't think about other people's needs if, if they're in survival mode. So their slogan is, "Well, my greedy, your greed." Look, number one, uh, and uh, and their, their their humor is kind of dark and cynical because they're putting others down. Because in trauma, what happens is uh, they reject their human self, find proxies to play, and shame the proxy playing their human self because that's what the mother did to them, and they've identified with her to have a mother. Okay, in trauma, they regress to the time in the uterus when they were on the throne. All babies in the in the uterus when they're on believe they're on the throne. That's called infantile megalomania. Uh, the, the glorified self, the idealized self, egocentricity, whatever you want to call it. So he, he reverts to that. Huge irony, because the baby was never a little god or king on the throne, but he kind of thought that. So in trauma, they, they have this self-sufficient superiority kind of complex, right? And their human self, that was shame, well, they find proxies to, to place it in. And do to them what the mother did to them, because in trauma, they, they identify with the mother to have a mother. So mother shamed them. They find others, they find proxies to play them while they play their mother. In this situation, they shame themselves, seeing that the proxies, the behaviors, they're shaming the proxy, thinking they're shaming themselves, being loyal to the mother. Okay, so they didn't unblend from the mother, they become her. And, and to not feel the pain of always being shamed by your mother, you find a proxy to play you and you shame the proxy, that's you. And you play the mother now. So there's a whole important discussion about identification with the aggressor. So if anger's at the console, you got identification with the aggressor. Um, and they got double think, Alice in Wonderland logic, Alice in Wonderland, up to down, left to right, flip flopping, double think, trance logic, um, um, and so on. They reject the human side of being human because it was rejected in them. So we got to get joy and sadness back. So sure enough, at the end of that film, joy and sadness did return. They did return. Odysseus did get home to Ithaca, his inner home. So his inner, his inner embodiment was a soul castle called Ithaca. And then Penelope came. Okay? When Miss Kor got pulled down, she came back to Persephone, and so on. So myths and fairy tales do talk about, we had it, we lost it, want to get it back. Universal common monomyth, we had our authentic self, we lost it, we want to get it back. The process of recognizing that it's lost, okay, that's part one, it's the virgin birth, and then the journey to get it back, yeah, that's the hero's journey or the second journey in midlife. So Joseph Campbell calls this a universal common monomyth for all people who are traumatized. To recognize roughly ballpark in midlife that they lost their authentic self. Uh, how, how do they know? How does a person know they lost their authentic self? What clues do they have? Like What, what makes a person think that uh, their false self is not the real self? Well, okay, well the real self will, will, uh, will protest within. Okay, so the energy um, that's for the real self to get your needs, and mother said no, that energy goes to the body. Now you get psychosomatic symptoms. So all these psychosomatic symptoms people are getting, it's like, it's like a covert crying for, for the needs, the covert anger at the mother. So go to Capex, K-E-P as in Paul, E-C-S, uh, about uh, maybe two weeks ago. Check out that quote by Capex. That's a great quote about the body bears the burden. Okay, so so the, the baby's crying and angry and crying, that's, that's natural. His energy is to communicate to his mother, Mother, I'm not, in, I'm not getting my needs met here. I'm giving the signal of this by my cries and my anger. And the mother, what if the mother shames him for? Whoa. Or gaslights him for? Like, whoa. So the natural direction of his communication, his life force, was to connect with the mother, to communicate with the mother. So it was like crying and anger and all this. Mother shamed him for it. That energy goes to the body, to the, to the organs, and now there's a pathological emotional investment into these organs that overwhelms the organs, and something in the body is going to go kaput. To that kaputness, uh, it's called a psychosomatic symptom, and that kaputness kind of continues the cry to the mother. It's a continuation. So it's like a covert crying. Baby couldn't cry directly, now he cries covertly through the symptoms. And then the mother goes, oh, Child's got symptom problem. Run to the doctor. Doctor, take care of his symptoms. The symptoms are a cry. Okay? Everything's love or a cry for love. So the baby's crying for love if he doesn't get his knees met.
Um, okay, give me a sec here. Hold on a sec. Yeah, I'll join you in a minute. Let me just take a one minute uh, break here. Let me just take a sip of my uh, ridiculously overpriced uh, coffee here. I shouldn't say that all things considering it's 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 very it's it's, it's, it's averagely priced. I'm in a nice area so things are expensive around here. So that, back to the authentic self that we're all born with, the word of the year 2023 authentic. The child has an authentic self. Okay, it's his embodiment, I feel their front amnes, enjoy sadness, and all those feelings mentioned earlier, including player right? and spontaneity and so on. So that, uh, it's there, but it got frozen, petrified, turned to stone, turned to stone. So in a myth or fairy tale, when a character that functions as a personification of a person's authentic self or real self, and that character, for example, Echo, or Faithful John in the Grimm's Tale, Faithful John, when a character that represents our authentic self turns to a statue, which those two characters did, Echo became a statue. That's one of the most underappreciated points I don't hear anybody talking about. Echo, at the end of that story, Echo became a statue. Right? The guy, Narcissus, became the little white flower. Okay, meaning he was addicted to the illusion that he was a little god all about him, symbiotic, right? So in the beginning, the baby is one with the mother. He's in a blissful oneness. That's that little white flower. That little white flower gives people a hallucinatory, blissful, woo, like wow feeling kind of thing, right? some kind of narcotic, narke, narcissist. Actually, the name narcissist comes from the Greek word narke, from the narcotic of that little white flower. I don't know the details of it, I'm not interested in it, but that little white flower, yeah, you can see uh, an image of it on the front cover of Alexander Lowen's book called Narcissism. So thousands of years ago, um, the storytellers were aware of this, that all babies think they're in a blissful feeling, they're in a blissful oneness. That's that little white flower to represent that blissful, wow-like feeling. The solipsism is just you, one with the powerful mother. And it's a solipsistic, a powerful, blissful, oceanic feeling. Unico mystica. That's the little white flower. Now, in normal development, that dissipates. That, that's all resolved. And he lands into his humanness post eight, be, uh, beginning at four to five months. And he gets his identity and it continues on afterwards. If the child's not loved, if he's shamed by the mother, he's still stuck there. He's still stuck with that illusionary thing. Okay? So he'll go to life, um, you know, searching for it by rejecting him, himself, his real self. That keeps him back um, in that place if he imitates the mother who shamed him. So mother shamed him. If he imitates her, he maintains that blissful, narc narcissistic, so quote unquote narcotic, uh, illusionary kind of feeling. So he's stuck in this loop. He thinks all about him, everything's for him. And how does he do it? He imitates the mother. Mother shamed him, he shames himself. He keeps him one with the mother who shamed him, if he shames himself. Okay, it's too painful to always shame yourself. So the trick is, although you imitate the mother, you are shaming yourself because you're replaying that loop, uh, you, you distract yourself from the pain of it by finding a proxy to play your innocence. And you shame the proxy to distract you of how you're shaming yourself. While you're doing that, you feel in a blissful uh, oneness of the mother. Now that proxy that you're shaming, right? As you're doing that, what's happening to your soul? That's echo. Echo became a statue. Echo became a statue. So echo and narcissist are not separate outer characters. They're personifications, they're elements of the psyche of one mind, of, of one person. They're parts of one person's mind. They're not separate, concrete, outer characters. You know, like, they're, 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 they're it's what's going on within. They're true on the inside. Myths and fairy tales are true on the inside, not on the outside. Myths and fairy tales are treated like dreams. 
and like soul stories. They're from the soul. It's a soul story. In that soul story, Echo became a statue. Narcissus became the little flower. That just means that the person with that mind, okay, didn't get loved, and his soul became a statue, turned to stone. So when the child's not loved, his his soul turns to stone. His real self turns to stone. That's Echo, and he's in this illusionary, blissful oneness of the mother who shamed him, and he's become her, and he goes to life maintaining that by perpetuating the stone feeling because every time you shame others you maintain the stone like situation so you're just perpetuating them you're not healing them imitating the mother going through life shaming others because your mother shamed you means your, your soul is still kind of stuck like that statuesque like that Hold on a second. oh that good thing oh no it's still, it's still there. You know, it's funny, I experimented coming here, because last Saturday, ironically, it wasn't too bad, it was, what is this, uh, I tried it again here. I'm trying it again here. Okay, never mind about that, yeah. I'm just thrilled to get these quotes out. Stay tuned, we got some good quotes on the BPD pattern coming, so stay tuned, hang in there. Hang in there. Or if you don't want to wait, just click the more link and read the quotes yourself directly and take Robert Bly's advice, your mission, should you choose to accept it. Uh, to read the quotes today there are 20 find one just see if you can find one hopefully you'll find one oh yeah back to Grice's criteria so these quotes here are um, all they're all relevant um, to the topic of at hand of how do we get back our real self how, how do we free up uh, echo make her be human again okay. how do we let the frozen woolly mammoth you know run again kind of thing how do we get joy and sadness back to the console? How do we, um, if, if it's a petrification, you know, how do, we, like the petrified frog, how do we get the frog to be alive and hop again? It's just some people just right in front of me here. Hold on a second. Another metaphor for attachment trauma, relational trauma, developmental trauma, rest of development, center development, okay, is that um, with, with the freezing, petrification turned to stone, there's this sense of not feeling real and alive. So for that, for those two parts, there's a story about the, the woodcut, the carpenter guy who took a block of wood and then carved out this little uh, figurine of a boy made out of wood and then was praying and oh please let this little boy made out of wood let him be human let him be alive kind of thing so we don't feel fully alive with trauma in other words okay the velveteen rabbit story the stuffed rabbit kept saying oh geez what does it mean to feel real i want to be real what does it mean to feel real i want to feel real okay, likewise with trauma we don't feel fully alive we don't feel fully real we don't feel fully real okay so these quotes are helping us to feel alive and real by, by creating a nest of knowledge to let nature do its thing. Once there's a nest of knowledge, um, feelings might start to come back. You might, to, you might start to accept yourself more once you have some theories. So you look for these theories. It's kind of like Rumpelstiltskin. These theories, these quotes are like searching for Rumpelstiltskin, like the word, what the name, the right name, right? So hopefully, uh, You'll find a rumple still skinny like quote in each video. Okay, so relevant, yeah, so relevant. These quotes are all, they're all relevant uh, to the topic of uh, creating the conditions to get back our feelings. Okay. 
Now the manor, yes, these quotes, they're mostly written by the shrinks. These are medical doctors, do no harm, soul doctors. So the manor is friendly, warm, empathetic. They have understanding about themselves. They, they, they understand you, they understand themselves. These, these, these uh, medical doctors are, these soul doctors have explored their own soul and uh, they're sharing their knowledge. So yeah, so the, the manor is there, it's warm and friendly. So roughly 90% of the quotes are from the shrinks. Now when I say shrinks, I mean medical doctors who then later on specialized in the talking cure. I don't mean, I don't mean shrinks who do the, the, the pills and all that. We're not talking about that. Well, maybe I can, um, hold on a sec. I'm wondering if maybe I can. See, they, they have like a security kind of guy there. Um, and before there was a, there was like a kind of a car kind of, well, now he's left, so. When I'm talking to him, like I'm staring right at the guy kind of thing. Bunch of the group there. Let, let's see how things change here. Problem is, there's no breeze here. Uh, you're gonna see me sweating here. Okay, so, so relevance, banner. Okay, the four, four Grice's four points. Relevance, manner. Okay. So the the quantity, as I mentioned earlier, not too short, not too long. Uh, so the quotes are like one or two. On average, they're like one or two sentences long. Sometimes it's just like one sentence, like a one-liner. Sometimes there's like a short, like a small paragraph. On occasion, there's a longer paragraph or a short passage. Very manageable in terms of quantity. Now the quality part is, that's my hope, that one out of 10 you'll like. That one out of 10 will be Rumpelstiltskin-y. The feeling that uh, you recognize something, that you like it. Oh. Let's just stay here a little longer. Um, well, if we get lucky, we'll see the swan, yeah. Well, one of them's there, yeah. His buddy's there. They got, they got two swans at this place. Uh, the, 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 rock, the, the famous one is the, the white one is on the other end there. Okay, if they, if they have to do their kind of chores over there, then maybe I'll, I might move it over here. Problem is there's, I don't get any breeze over here. So it's, you know, it's still pretty hot. Actually, today's a little better. Luckily, today's a little better. A little overcast. There's a little rain in the morning, so it's a little better today. Uh, huge relief, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, okay, so these 10,000 quotes, um, you know, they're clear, um, uh, the quality, hopefully one out of 10 you'll like, uh, quantity, not too short, not too long, okay, the manners, warm and friendly, and they're all relevant um, to um, knowing ourselves, know thyself, know thyself. Most of the self is unknown to us. This authentic, real self is unknown to us. It's so unknown to us that we sometimes call it the denied self, the second self, the repressed self, the secret self, the shadow self, the shadow soul. It's the one who walks with me, who's not like me, who is me. Someone's living my life, I know nothing about him. In literature, it's the motif of the double character. All of the energy in this repressed self is called the id. And then uh, we want it where, where it was, ego shall be. So when you are aware of something from your repressed self and you make it conscious, Hermes flies across with a message about something about you that you don't know. Now you're aware of it. That's Hermes flying across. Now you accept something about yourself. You're becoming more integrated. So John A. Sanford, the author of the book called Healing and Wholeness, uh, says it simply. If, if our real self, our authentic self is kind of quote unquote fragmented from us, that's a pain like that to have a gap between our denied real self and our sort of adaptive false self, which uh, we, you know, we use to go to drive a car and go through life and all this. And you don't want that, and that gap is a kind of a pain kind of thing. Well, if we get back our real self, we're more whole. That's healing, wholeness and healing, name of this book. Very good book by John A. Sanford. 
Um, I mean, I mean the Johnny Sanford who wrote that book, uh, Healing and Wholeness, Invisible Partners, um, and um, he, he also does Miss Fairy Tales. He also puts Miss and Fairy Tales on the couch. He also gives you psychological interpretations of Miss Fairy Tales and and actually uh, quite a few religious stories as well. He, he puts religious stories in the same category as uh, Miss and Fairy Tales and Dreams because they're all from that unconscious world. They're all called from the primary process pictorial Alice in Wonderland world. So when he says, so in the case of religious stories, he says, you know, don't get bogged down, was that real? Or don't get stuck like, don't, they're metaphors for psychology. Look for the psychological message. So if, if you hear, if you learn about a religious story, look for the psychological message, he says. Now once again, anytime throughout, whenever we mention a religion, the psychology of religion or religious stories, it's, it's only limited to specifically when religion is being specifically used as a tool of the pillage and the plunder system. Because religion uh, keeps people uh, with a certain mindset that's needed for the pillage and the plunder. That's a whole topic, uh, 27, 25, part 3 of 3, uh, we kind of ran through it. It's a seven and a half hour video, it needs to be updated, but anyways, there's sort of a starting point there. Um, of how religion is used as a tool of the pillage and the plunder. Yeah, because, uh, so there's a whole body material. I, yeah, take, if I start that, it's gonna take seven hours. I need guava juice to do that video. Uh, unfortunately, it's all sold out, my God. What spinach was for Popeye, guava juice was for me. I feel kind of, for a short time, they were selling guava juice, fresh pressed guava, like a good, like a good guava, and they fresh pressed of it. I thought, oh my God, I had like a half a liter of that thing. And I, I could speak for eight or ten hours, and that felt good. And I could probably do longer. It was it was very nutritious. It was very fresh. It didn't last very long. Um, now now I'm, so now I'm back to like um, coconut water, tangerine juice is a little bit okay. Um, so um, so my videos are shorter now. <laughs> Actually, I think he's is he still there? See, it's cooler there if I go there. Actually, that, uh, he's looking better. You know, that black swan, um, yeah, he's looking stronger and healthier. Yeah, I think before when I saw him, he was looking, he was looking a little, um, no, he, he looks more plumper, he looks, uh, he looks uh, way better than last time I saw him. Yeah. Maybe he was uh, under the weather for a while or something. Oh, he looks good now, yeah. Want to see the other one? Okay, he's way at the other end there. I don't know if you can see him. Can you see him at the at the end there, near near the umbrella? You know, I gotta be careful. Some one time he tried to grab my phone. Hey there, Swan. How you doing? Be seeing it. Are, are we getting him in the camera? Well, there he is. He's a local celebrity, this guy. A lot of people come and take his photo. He's on the... Um... I think he might have been on the newspaper once or something. I'm 
not sure. But he's a, he's a, Nice place here, I really love this place. A lot, lot, of, lot of company functions and group, group, act, group functions take place here. Let's see, can I go back? Ah, oh, no, he's still there, huh? Ah. See the, the, the guard, see I'm, uh, that's sort of where the guard hangs out. It's just a little awkward to stare at him while I'm talking to him. Yeah, let, let me bring this stuff here, yeah. Let's finish the introduction and then we'll get into the BPD quotes. So, the child has a primal need for what's called a secure attachment style. The secure attachment style, I'm not going to run through the whole list of it. Um, let's just say it sounds kind of obvious, right? Safety, attunement, mother's sweetness and caring and presence, rhythm of safety, her reverie, her consideration, and her today's term, the mentalizing. You know, she can recognize the child's moods and, and she has kind of a soul empathetic vision and recognition and acceptance of the baby situation and she can hold it and quote unquote um, recognize that the child feels seen by her. If the mother sees the child, he can see himself. What the mother does to the child, the wiring gets laid in, he does it to himself. Because of the fusion there. Because of the fusion, because all one, human connections lead to neural connections. The baby's brain is so malleable, so plastic, they say. So how the, ba how the mother's treating him, uh, that that baby's brain is laying down all these circuits and wiring by that relationship. So we want a normal relationship to lay down quote unquote normal circuits, right? If that relationship is problematic or dysfunctional or, or the mother shaming him, using him, what's he gonna remember by that? He's gonna have some very painful wiring. Okay, so the internal working model will be very painful. Um, that's unfinished business, that's a pain. Okay, so his, um, his soul gets flash frozen. That's the woolly mammoth image. That's a pain. Jana puts a, a neon light there, a blinking neon electro neurochemical light in front of that flash frozen uh, image, where, the, where that says that blinks on and off. Unloved, unloved needs not met. Meaning, when when we say unloved for the baby, he means the needs are not met. The needs not met. Needs not. That's unloved. Unloved pain. So now he's now he gets to swoon. So this is, uh, now in nature, when something or someone is wounded, it's trying to heal. Now the baby doesn't know time. There's no time there. There's no time there. But he still has those needs. So, he tried to get those needs. But the, he did try. But he forgot. He, has no, he doesn't know time. So, so there's a, hence the conflict. He's got a huge conflict. He was, he was rejected already, or shamed by the mother. That's a lot of pain like that. But he still has those needs. So he's gonna reach out for those needs. Because of the rejection by the mother, he's gonna reach out, because there's no time. So, but he, he doesn't want the pain again. Um, on another level, he doesn't want the pain. So, but he still has the needs. So he's trying to reach out for his needs, but wait a minute, the pain is there. So this is a huge conflict. Okay, that's called the inner conflict. It's repressed, it, it's a conflict, it's recorded in the first brain, it's repressed, first brain, second brain, third brain, pressed down into that survival brain. All the energy's in there, it's about survival kind of thing. Oh, that's a, oh, no, a different one. I wouldn't mind going back there because it's, it's easier there. I know this corner spot, it's nice here, but for some reason, this this corner, um, like I got no, uh, I got the parking lot there. For some reason, the breeze isn't quite, there's a little flowy, there's no breeze through here. I 
Unless I go there and just sort of turn around. Kind of yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's do that. Give me a second. Let's let's move it over here. You know. Does this work? Let's, how's that? So everything's love or a cry for love, right? In, all, in normal development, the child is love. He has a consciousness of his uniqueness, which he expresses. That's called loving life. A path with heart, pleasure, meaning. Uh, he's good, right? He's loving life. He's, in, he's got his golden ball, he's got his embodiment, he's loving life, everything's okay. Normal development. So if he doesn't get that, obviously we're supposed to have that, so we didn't get the needs for it, so we're crying for love, meaning we're crying for those needs. So the need was for a secure attachment style. Edmund Berger, one of our mentors, uh, has a sort of a metaphor for this phenomenon, as follows. First of all, this neurosis that we're talking about, this inner conflict, Okay. Neurosis is the petrification of this inner conflict and it's repressed. It's in that survival brain on all of our energies in that brain. A lot of power like that. The id, the powerful like that. Right? And this id is this compulsion to A, get mother's love. B, in nature we're wounded, so get mother's love. So it's like a compulsion like this, repetition compulsion. So it makes the person neurotic because um, they're... they're still living in the past, the present is still the past. Emotionally, the real self is in the past, no time. All time is that time. Now, yes, there's a famous split here. The real self is frozen, the rest of development, center development, etc. And then the person develops a scaffolding of uh, mechanisms of the mind, bundles it up and creates some kind of false personality structure, basically. And he, and he goes to life with that, and he can still get 10 PhDs, and he can still get 10 medals, he can still get 10, write 10 books or whatever. Or 20 books, 30 books, some of these characters, right? But if you look, yeah, I heard an interview with one guy who wrote 20 books or something. Oh my God, he had a real negative, uh, hostile uh, tone, and uh, he, he had a, what they, uh, what they called it, he had a, what they call a frozen anger in his voice. He had like a seething, frozen anger in his voice. And uh, he was very narcissistic and um, uh, very controlling and very demanding and uh, very cynical. You, you could feel it. He was really an uh, incredible resume, yes. It didn't matter. You see, it didn't matter. We live to the extent that we feel. So his false self was very accomplished in all this. Um, and, that, and, that's, and why he was seething like that? Because he doesn't feel. When a person doesn't feel, that's pain. That pain leads to tension. Okay? That, that tension disperses. And it dispersed all over his physiology, including his tone of voice. So that guy had a, really had a kind of harsh kind of tone. It was like a, a tone that kind of coerced the listener to, you listen to me when I'm talking. Like it had a kind of like a forceful, demanding kind of a, a expectation and a, almost like a psychotic kind of like be one with me and listen to me because I didn't get I didn't get I didn't get one with this I didn't get one this with my mother you listener are going to be the inter you interviewer and your and your audience you're going to be the good breast and, and you all be one with me admire me be one with me make me feel special and uh, 
or you be amazing and I'm a part of you, or you would, or I'm I'm an infantile God and you admire me. He had that kind of uh, real quality to him, and uh, I, I couldn't listen. I I can't listen to these kind of characters anymore. I don't care what they know anymore. I, I don't listen to them anymore. If I hear like for one minute, I oh, I can't listen to this. And usually it's all you'll always feel worse afterwards. So so yeah. And uh, yesterday's quote, uh, the lady said. Every time she calls her mother and talks to her on the phone, she always feels worse afterwards. A lot of children, they run to their mother for their problem. The mother amplifies their worries and exaggerates the disaster, and the child feels worse afterwards. You know, so that's, I think, uh, I feel like that, uh, I feel like that uh, with some, some of these uh, guests uh, that the interviewers might have. So my point was, the false self can still get 10 PhDs, 10 medals, write 10 books, whatever, but we live to the extent that we feel. Now embedded in all that knowledge, embedded in all that book knowledge, it's meant, it's meant to include the knowledge that they're using knowledge to get away from their, to repress the pain, to get away from their feelings. They're meant to use the knowledge to know that knowledge is meant to help you weave a basket to accept your feelings. Don't, not to use knowledge to get you away from the feelings, but if you are using knowledge to get away from your feelings, that's called intellectualization, rationalization, then, then, be, then have it embedded that you're doing that, interpret that, that you're doing that, and that's a sign of trauma that you're doing that, because you're running away from your feelings, um, and you're using knowledge to have ideas to repress the pain and you get more pain, so more ideas, more books to repress, more pain, more pain, more books. You're, you're stuck, have the knowledge that you're doing this kind of thing. But that character, that guy there, uh, didn't have that kind of, uh, he, he would mock psychoanalysis. He would shame it and put it down and then uh, adopt some self, adopt some arrogant philosophies that he knows it all kind of thing, um, and, but would reject and shame psychoanalysis. You see, psychoanalysis would tell you, would analyze what that guy's doing kind of thing. That's, that's, the, that's sort of the help, that's sort of the, the one difference between psychoanalysis and all these other philosophies and things is that it puts things on the couch. It tries to help understand uh, more honestly uh, people's resistance uh, around facing the truth that mother failed them, that mother hurt them, that mother was soul blind to them, that mother betrayed them, that mother had talionic feelings towards the baby, that the mother saw her own ill mother into the child and treated her child as her own ill mother. That, that's a huge betrayal. That's called the betrayal trauma. And if there's so much pain like that, um, see, we're resistant to this knowledge. The truth will upset you free. And, uh, and yesterday, yeah, we mentioned Christina, what's her name? Christina Crawf Crawford or something. The daughter of the famous movie star, uh, Joan Crawford or something. And, um, and uh, she, she wrote a famous book in the 70s called Mommy Dearest, sort of sarcastic, um, about the abuse she experienced growing up with her. And she's a famous movie star, and everybody was enraged at this daughter. How dare you say such a blasphemy? How dare you say such a negative thing about your mother? She raised you, and how can you, how can you criticize her? She's your mother. But people who have been in their shoes, they read her book and they go, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and they, so now there's a, so people who are in touch with the pain of, of living, of growing up in a dysfunctional uh, home, uh, meaning the mother has the BPD pattern. So the, the, the basic story was, uh, according to the author uh, uh, Lawson in her book, Understanding Borderline Mothers, she refers to Joan uh, Crawford as being uh, the bully, uh, one of the bully versions and she quotes uh, both from the mother, where she explains why she abused her children. Um, and her point was, well, that mother didn't know the pain of, that she felt when she was abused, so she repeats it. And, and the daughter was saying, oh my God, um, you know. Do we have it here? Uh, Laura saw her mother as a self-centered queen, the bully who periodically transformed into a witch. Oh, here it is. Now, Christina Crawford, 78, um, the adopted daughter of actress Joan Crawford, grew up, grew up with a mother like Laura's and described her experience in her famous autobiography, Mommy Dearest, quote, 
each time I ran headlong, each time I ran headlong into an abyss, that black hole where nothing followed logically, where fabrication and anger and turmoil ruled, ruled supreme. So women with the BPD pattern, they flip-flop, they deny, they forget. You, you said that. No, I didn't. They forgot it. You said it. They act like they said what the other person just said, and they act like you said what they just said. Like they flip things around, um, catch them if you can, they don't admit to anything. Uh, they, they're in survival mode all the time. So there's a, a black, quote unquote, uh, no real logic here, and they use, they use um, ex intense, exaggerated emotions, which they can flip and twist, and so the BPD, right, all the dramatics, the soap operas, right? That place where there was no help and no peace and no escape from the juggernaut of, from the juggernaut of chaos. From her throne, uh, in the eye of the hurricane, brandishing her magic wand of obsession, ruled the queen of chaos herself, Mommy Dearest, name of her book. Children of mothers with the BPD of mind and survivors of hurricanes have much in common. Survival is dependent on finding a safe place, staying low and not being fooled by the eye of the storm. The BPD, uh, the Borderline Mother, which edition, which version? So Christine Lawson has the waif, the turtle, uh, sorry, the, the hermit, the waif, the hermit, the bully she calls the queen and the witch. The, the BPD witch emerges when the mother and child are alone. That's the key here. When the two of them are alone, you see, uh, that mother um, has immunity. The father says, well, mother knows best. Uh, and when that intimate, with that intimate situation, the rage that mother had with her mother, she transfers her ill mother to the child and now has talionic feelings of wanting to control her mother. Sees her mother to the child, therefore control the child. So that's the witch phenomenon. The witch's tone of voice conveys a clear message of hatred, but children of witch mothers are like, are like snake handlers who frequently bitten develop immunity. With time, a thick layer of scar tissue eventually covers the wounds. Okay, in the recent, in the recent videos, uh, I covered sort of, in the past few videos, I covered sort of this Lawson's, uh, uh, some of her, descriptions of those four types the waif the hermit the bully one she calls uh, the witch uh, the, the queen one like uh, Joan Crawford according to her and, and, the, and the witch one well since we're sort of heading into it why don't um, why don't I just continue where we're at in this moment and if I remember, I'll pick up on where we left off about the record. Or should we finish the record? Yeah, let's finish the record. Edma, that's a sort of a foundational piece here. Repetition compulsion. So that, that conflict, the baby has a conflict. He has needs, but he remembers the pain. What does he do with that conflict? It's in his brain. It's in the first brain. Now, the compulsion means that memory loop is spinning around all the time, right? Because there's no time. He's crying for love, mother said no, still has the need, mother said no, need, no, need, no. So they're spinning in a very painful situation. And he's numbed, endorphins, numb, endorphins, pain, frozen, numb, and spinning. So when the third brain comes online, the third brain, post roughly age three ballpark, that, that, that memory goes to the third brain. As if the first brain says to the third brain, third brain, help out here. Third brain says, uh, what's going on here? Well, I don't have words here, but I need your help. Well, what do you want me to do here? I don't know, just help, do something. So that circuit goes to the third brain and all the energy pushes uh, the third brain. So the third brain follows that loop, but the third brain doesn't know what it's about, but it's gonna follow that loop. So meaning it's gonna cry for love and not know that it's gonna cry for love and it's gonna cry for love, not know that there's pain of not being loved. So now it's symbolic. 
So now they're going to search for materialism, money, matter, goods, shopaholic, material, thinking material, money, matter might be mother, or cookies might be a maternal sweetness, choose physical sweet, like symbols of mother sweetness, or alcoholic spirits as a symbol of maternal spirit. Like you're searching for something symbolic of mother. So you're still searching for mother's love. Or you flip it, find proxies to play you, and, sh and uh, say no to them the way your mother said no to you. The flies are back here. What are the companion, yeah, the companion, wait, let me just talk, the companion animals to 1001, windmills of the mind, are the blue jay, the heron, the swan now, the swan for sure, the crow, the keeper of psychological, the keeper of psychological knowledge, says some indigenous cultures, the crow, the blue jay, the pigeon, the crow, the blue jay, the heron, the loon, the loon, the mosquito, um, I don't really have the fly in it, yeah, I just, I just called it the mosquito, the bee, the bumblebee, I remember once uh, I had the bumblebee, um, while I'm talking on the phone here, I had the bumblebee on the, sitting on the camera right on top here, and I was just talking to you, well, my imaginary audience, and I could see the bumblebee looking at me while I'm talking to you. And I'm <laughs> it only lasted for like half a second, but I saw vividly, very clearly, this, this massive bumblebee staring right at me. <laughs> oh, hold on a second. Okay, the gecko and the cat and there are a few others, yeah. We've got some companion beverages to our collection here. The guava juice, the tangerine juice. Um, Hollander's 0.0, .0 non-alcoholic beer out of, out of Munich. Um, oh boy. Um, Egyptian licorice mint tea by the Yogi Tea Company, if you can find it. And, um, and there's a couple of others. Just a fun little thing, kind of fun little thing I'm doing on the side here. Uh, we've got 23 awards, golden witness of the mind awards issued already to audiovisual material. No, no, no. Christine Lawson's book is not is not nominated, so she unfortunately that book won't be getting it. Uh, there are a few good quotes in which I've included, but most of that book is too sensationalistic, too. Too vague and too overlapping and uh, too contradictory a little bit. It's, it's slightly borderline-ish and her examples are, you know, it's funny, she even says it that the witch uh, gets her identity by scaring people. In her book she does it. I feel like that book is a bit witchy because her examples are like the one in the billion examples. The most horrifying kind of examples uh, uh, she, she would list and focus on. But not all of it's like that. Um, one of my favorite quotes of hers is the one about um, how, how mothers with the BPD mind intensify and exaggerate uh, the baby's fears. And that, that was a good point that she made about that, I thought. Okay, so back to the record. Let's call it the cry for love, like a song. Imagine it pressed on a 45 disc record. One of the songs on our soundtrack is Roll Me Away by um, uh, uh, Bob Seger. Yeah, Bob Seger. Um, there's a touching line in there. At the end of that song, he said, you know, it's about wanting to escape from your problems. But next time, I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna learn my lesson and do things right. Next time, we'll get it right. You know. we'll get back, back to the record. Imagine a 45 disc record, uh, and, and there's only one song on those 45. Side B is the same song as side A, or the, there are no grooves on the back side. There's only one song on the, on the side A, right? Let's call it, the, let's call it the, the cry for love. It's the memory, it's the grooved in memory of the relational memory of baby crying mother said no. 
in whatever way or form that she did it in. Jeez, why, why is there so many flies here? Yeah, yeah, give me just another half a minute here. Hold on a sec. I gotta bring some. Um, I think next time I'll bring some uh, mosquitoes with Helen or something. Edmund Berger, one of our mentors, says every neurotic is a music enthusiast, but he only has one record, this record that we're talking about. He carries this one record with him everywhere he goes. Every time he sees a turntable with never-ending fiery ardor, the compulsion, he runs to the turntable, plugs it in, turns it on, puts the 45 on the turntable, well, first he puts the, uh, the 45 on the turntable, then he puts it on, picks up the needle, and then puts it on and plays the tune. Meaning, the metaphor is, in the new situation, he's going to replay that scene with others in the present, transfer his acting out. He's going to transfer that interaction with the mother in the past to the present and act it out like actors, like, the, like a theater thing. And there are two ways to do it. The more psychotic, perverse way, uh, and the more sort of kind of benign kind of direct way. That's an important point here. Uh, we discussed it in the last video, yeah, so if you want um, more information on it, kind of refer you to the last video. But let's just do an abbreviation, uh, an abbreviated version of it here. If the baby's traumatized prior to 18 months, it's going to be the perverse psychotic way. Meaning, child is so emotionally abused by his mother he crosses over and becomes her and rejects himself he goes through life finding proxies to play his his uh, unloved self and rejects them the way his mother rejected him and then when he rejects people in the present flip-flop hocus pocus auto hypnosis double focus double think trans logic flip-flop alice one lamb the one you just heard in the present he'll say is the mother who heard him back in the nursery now he feels justified to control the victim because the victim is his mother in the nursery and the baby wants the mother to change her ways to provide the love. Psychotic stuff. Oh, a, I should give these people some privacy. There's, there's a, a young couple taking photos here. Let, let me, um, let's go back down a bit. There's a swan, yeah, let's visit the swan for a minute. Oh, he's grooming himself, all right. Are they finished? Oh yeah, okay.
pedestal. Now yeah, there's a young couple, sort of like a romantic young couple, taking all sorts of photos just, just near me there. So I want to give them their privacy. Okay, let's just uh, maybe I can uh, sit here. Okay, let's go back to the, the spot here. Hang in there, sorry. Sorry for these little delays. Still there? All right. They must like that spot. They're taking all their photos right there. Um, okay, let's, let's continue here. So, if the baby's traumatized prior to 18 months, that means that infant, that means that infantile megalomania, that narcissism is still there. He regresses to the time in the uterus when he was on the throne and says he's self-sufficient, superior, and above it all kind of thing. His human, quote unquote, more human side of being human, the feeling, vulnerable, trusting self, that's so shamed and unloved by the mother, he'll project it to the proxies. So when a stink, so all of the personality, all of the personality patterns that develop uh, prior to 18 months uh, lead to one of the stinger personality patterns. What are the narcissistic patterns, the bully pattern? Uh, Grothstein says if you fuse one of the narcissistic patterns, if you fuse the bully pattern with any of the narcissistic patterns, you can have the lower functioning BPD pattern. Today's topic, Iago. That's the very envious character. Um, Iago is the guy that he's really he's like he's really witchy, but he's covert. He spreads rumors against others, gets others against themselves, and hides in his little lair or whatever. Um, so he wants to see goodness damage, and he does it by getting others against themselves. Because mother damaged his soul, he identified with her. To have a mother, the condition is she's got to hate goodness because his mother hated his goodness. Identifies with her outwardly. Anything that's good, he's got to hate it or see it wrecked because it was wrecked in him. That's the Iago pattern. And there are other there are other stinger personality patterns sort of in that area, but the commonality of all the stinger personality patterns is a they reject their uh, vulnerable real self and find proxies to play their own real self, which they'll shame because the mother shamed it in them. Them shaming themselves using the proxy to do so, um, not caring about the reality of the proxy being a person. All this they only see they only see the need to be one with the mother. Remember that Oedipus complex. They're still one like that. That's what Mr. Freud meant. That's that's like like the primal thing we got to be aware of. That all babies need to feel safe with the mother to have their identity. If they don't, they're still married there like that. And there's no father. Father missing father means um, the mother didn't have a, a soul vision, um, like an active soul vision, like an ego, like an active soul vision. Uh, for the child, so there's no mis missing father energy. Is still there? I'm going to just hang on here for a bit longer. Um, right, so. A basic point here is all babies must have a mother. No baby would make it if they didn't have a mother. So what does a child do if, his, if the mother's hurting him? He identifies with her. That's how he has a mother. Now, but the condition is that quote-unquote deal with the you-know-who because he makes his mother into an image of an aggressive creature like the guy with the horns, like the Cyclops in the Odyssey, like the Boar Queen in the White Bear King Balaman story, like the soul, the witch one, Emi, uh, in Hansel and Gretel. Okay, the baby has oral rage and grief, puts it onto the mother image and makes the mother a hungry wolf, frightening character, and so on. So, uh, he's, he identifies with that frightening image, ironically, and is going to be greedy. But to not feel the pain, of, of hurting himself, he finds the proxies to play his child self and shames the proxy. And it doesn't erase that he was hurt by his mother. 
So then he flips it and says, well, the reason he's feeling bad now is because the one he just hurt is the mother who hurt him back in the past, not realizing that he's playing the shaming mother. So it's all twisted and flipped and flopped like this. That's part of the borderline. So part of the borderline psychology is a lot, a lot of this flipping and, and inverting and he catch me if you can't catch me. That, that phenomena, that phrase, catch me if you can't catch me. Um, now you see it, now you don't. That, that whole phenomena is the borderline, part of the borderline psychology because they won't admit to anything because they're in survival anxiety. They, they have immense survival anxiety. So they'll flip, twist, deny, blame, surprise, stony silence, forget, disassociate, blank out, turn. That's why shrinks don't want to help. Shrinks always run away from clients with the BPD pattern because they don't want to cooperate. They're, they're just uh, too afraid. Um, just, just relating to somebody brings up all these fears. So they're in survival anxiety, just relating to people. Kind of thing. Let's see if we can, like once in a while, the, the swan flap, he, he um, flaps his wings. It's, it's a pretty cool sight. Let's see, uh, let's see if he'll do it uh, this time. I think, uh, I think twice uh, we, we caught him uh, flapping his wings. Uh, in previous videos. Okay. We're okay, gonna get back on track here. So the sting of personality, so one um, backdrop point is this thing called identification with the aggressor, where the baby uh, is first one with the mother. But there's no loving mother for him to know himself. He's still one with the mother. Now the mother's hurting him. Now the baby's clinging to her even more. Now that fusion becomes sticky. They call it adhesiveness. Like, like a, and this becomes mucky. That's called being stuck in the tar pit of a negative union with the mother. Like, okay, it's so painful like this. So finally, he does the most drastic thing any, ba any baby can do. He'll say, fine, I won't know myself. I won't know my embodiment. I won't know my feelings. I won't have pleasure in life. I won't mourn any losses. I won't have play. I won't, you know, I won't, um, I won't live the human side of being human. I'll just be in survival mode. I'll just be you, mother. What did you do to me, mother? You shame me. Fine, I'll just be you, to have you. Because part of the reason is the baby must have an attachment to the mother. He couldn't make it without a mother. Plus, embed another layer to this is when the mother is hurting the baby, the baby thinks maybe as if Everything's love or a cry for love. Hey, mother, you're not loving me. What's going on here? I, I feel your hate and you're taking revenge on me. I'm not your mother. Oh boy, you're really in pain, mother. You're not loving me. Okay, not loving the baby is a cry for love. Mother, you're crying for love here. Now, don't worry, mother, I'll save you. I'll cure you, I'll heal you. I'll make you be a loving mother. I'll fix you, I'll make you be a loving mother. I'll save you. It's as if maybe the mother might say, if she were, uh, it's as if maybe the mother might say, I'm sorry, baby, to put you in this situation. I don't think it works like that. You can't save me. Um, mother, I gotta try. I need you to be loving mother. You're hurting me. I gotta fix you. I gotta cure you. Uh, cure you. Uh, I gotta heal you. Um, well, baby, it doesn't work like that. I have no choice. I gotta make you be a loving mother. If you're hurting me, I gotta make you be a loving mother. So I'm gonna try to fix you. Oh, gee, baby, sorry to put you in this situation here. I don't think it's going to work. Oh, don't stop saying that. I, I got to fix you. I can't give up. I got to have hope here. Well, what are you going to do, baby? Well, mother, tell me something. What did you need? Well, baby, when I was a baby, I needed my mother to be a symbiotic object and see me and mirror me and be one with me and give me a blissful oneness. Look, don't worry, mother. We're already one, right? I'll just play that missing good mother experience that you needed. How's that going to work? Well, I'll mimic you. I'll be just like you. Maybe you'll feel seen by that. That's not gonna work, baby. Oh, stop saying that. I gotta fix you, I gotta try. So the baby um, is gonna mimic her. So what did the mother do to the baby? The mother hated him. So he hates mother, I'm gonna hate myself. No, in reality, that's too painful to keep hating himself. So he will hate himself, but to trick him, to distract him, to not be aware of it, he finds a proxy to play him and hates them and says they're no good. 
enter all the dark humor, shaming humor, put down humor, sarcastic humor, pessimistic humor, you know, and the, and, uh, the pain, and imagine Mr. Pain cranking out like a little tr a cranking device, uh, churning out these little barbs, these little witty, cynical little digs and put down comments, you see, um, that's the pain doing it. So he's got to put others down with his dark humor, shaming humor, okay, because that's what his mother did to him. And now he's addicted. Because when he does that, he recreates that blissful oneness that he had with the mother. Remember the narcissist's flower? the blissful, addictive feeling? That narcissist's flower is an addictive feeling. So he's addicted to hate. He's addicted to shaming others. He's addicted to saying others are bad, no good. He'll memorize ex with a sadistic glee it, all, that dictionary of put-down terms. He'll find a dictionary of every insult, put-down term ever created and say, oh, you're this and you're that and you're, you're, you're no good this and fill in the blank, right? That, that, keeps him, that, that keeps him loyal to the mother who said that to him. Look, mother, you shame me. See how I'm shaming others? We're one. Don't you feel seen? Isn't that great? We're, we're in a blissful oneness. So he's going to keep on doing this with the hope and fantasy that by doing this, somehow the mother magically will feel seen and then switch, switch and be healed and be a loving mother, turn around, provide love for the baby so he can know himself and stop shaming others. So he's shaming others to please the mother, kind of thing, to save the mother, to cure the mother, to protect the mother. Morton, so for more on this point, go to 2291 and 2 by Morton Kisan. Oh, this just flew down. Oh, oh. Well, it's all dried out now. Yeah. Oh, it still, got a, still has a bit of a scent here. Yeah. It's got sort of like a, like a pollen on it. It still has a... There's still some scent on it, yeah. It used to be a bright yellow, now it's kind of grayish, or no, brownish, huh? Uh, about a couple of weeks ago, these were bright yellow inside, now it's all. Twenty-two ninety-one and 2, 22 TQs 22 91 and 2 by Morton Kisan. K I double -S, S E N, Kisen. Morton Kisen. Uh, those are two important, those are, those are lengthy quotes. Um, it's, there's an example of a lengthy quote. There are two very lengthy quotes, uh, 2291 and 2292. I highly recommend those two uh, quotes. There's kind of like pillar quotes here about how dysfunction is trying to still save the mother, this whole topic. Another, on the topic, another kind of pillar quote here in our collection is the one done by Paul Libby Russell, 22, no, no, sorry, 2119, 2119, Paul Libby Russell, on the topic of repetition compulsion. Uh, that's another pillar quote, uh, plus there's some follow-up to it, post that, but start there with 2119. Uh, that's some good foundational material here. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to, uh, Read through those three videos, the quotes in those three videos, 2119 and then 2291 and 2. Now, I, th I think, uh, I, I felt uh, kind of a uh, I felt like a sort of a, okay, now, now I'm starting to understand what the psychoanalysis stuff is all about. I'm starting, now I'm starting to, um, I feel something about it somehow. Okay, back, so back to that record. So, if the person has a stinger personality pattern, in the new situation, they look at the record. What do the records say? Mother shamed them. But in the new situation, they don't play themselves anymore. They're going to play the shaming mother who shames them. Too painful to keep shaming themselves. So they got to find a proxy. Again, proxy means someone who plays a role for you, uh, plays an identity for you, who feels for you, who does something for you, etc. So in the new situation, somebody with a single personality pattern will find a non-threatening substitute other. Any other, it doesn't matter. They, they don't see the reality of the other. They just need some kind of other. 
and in their psychosis, um, they put in um, their impression of their unloved self. So the proxy plays their unloved self. Okay, now they replay the record. They pick up the needle, replay the record. Mother shamed them, they're the shaming mother. The proxy plays them. So they, sh they shame with their negative humor, dark humor, put down humor, they'll say, oh, you're no good this, you're a bad this, or whatever, whatever it is. And they can have a PhD, they can have 10 PhDs and put down terms for it. Uh, that doesn't matter about that. So it can be uh, very witty and veiled, or it can be more blunt or whatever, but it's still, still the same basic kind of thing. So they just replayed the record, okay? They found someone to cry for love. The proxy cries for love in their imagination, and they shame them. Just like when they were a baby, mommy, I, I have needs. Mother shamed him. Oh my God, that's a very painful thing. He can't keep doing that. So he finds proxies, imagines they have needs, and just shames them, replaying in their in their attitude, in their negative behavior, or their negative things they say, or whatever it is, whatever form it takes. Imagine that, eh? The baby. Number one, the mother's misattuned to the baby. There's a problem. The baby says, oh, mother, you're, you're misattuned. You didn't meet my signals. Well, let, let me communicate this to you. So with my cries and my anger, and mother says, what are you crying about? Oh, get over it. Don't be such a baby, baby. I don't see it. No, really, I, you didn't meet my needs, and, uh, and that's okay, because I'm going to cry and let you know about it. Oh, well, I don't know what you want. This, you're bothering me here. Whoa. Double insult, right? So he becomes her now. He becomes her. Finds proxies to play his child place. New situations, the proxies can play the child place, and he does to them what the mother did to him. Mother didn't see, mother was so blind to him, didn't recognize his feelings and needs, didn't have empathy or so-called mentalization or consideration or recognition for their personhood. Babies are feeling beings. Babies feel, babies have feelings. Uh, babies are, have a little identity and all this. Mother didn't see it, didn't care. So identify with her and don't care about others. Mother didn't care about them. Identification with the aggressor. So they're, they're replaying how the mother hurt them by finding proxies to play them. As they do it, they feel some kind of pain on it. They still relive the pain of it. So now, flip. The one they just heard in the present, they'll say is the monster mother who hurt them back in the nursery. Now when I say monster mother back in the nursery, it's not the reality of the mother being a monster. It's the baby's image that he creates of her. He takes some benign image, some kind of disappointing image of the mother, of her. Not at first it wasn't a monster, it was just a disappointing mother was mis distracted, busy, unavailable, confused. So the mother's not meaning to hurt the baby, but his rage inflates, uh, like, the, like the balloons they had here, it inflates and makes up some kind of twisted image of her as a monster. Now, okay, so then in the new situation, the, the one the other plays the shame self, then the other plays the monster mother image. Because he is fused with her. He was shamed and he becomes the aggressive mother image. So others first, so find others to first play his shame self, and then flips it, oh, the other is the mo monster image in the past, because there's no time, no time. That's why people with the BPD, narcissistic pattern, Iago pattern, um, they're, they're, not, they're that, that, so I think that phrase, survival anxiety, is one of the best phrases I've come across so far to describe this, to get to humanize the positive intention of their behavior. They're in survival anxiety, they're in survival mode. They didn't get enough love to love life. Everything's love or a cry for love. That cry for love is, is a survival need. That love is for the, was for their survival kind of thing. So that's why they use all these tricks and duplicity and flip-flopping and, and uh, And now you're getting into the now you're getting into the whole art of BSing called rhetoric and propaganda and advertising tricks. They're using trans logic and exploiting other people's vulnerability and sensing their vulnerability and exploiting it and making it feel guilty 
and turning it around, equivocation, make things open so you can twist and flip and blame them, okay? If they're innocent, you act like you're innocent. And you're, you hurt them, you act like they hurt you. And you create excuses and shame them for all this. And you, they're in survival mode, you see? So the BPD quotes uh, we've done so far are not bad. There's some very good BPD quotes uh, posted in their past recent videos. I highly recommend them, yeah. Yeah, so thanks to, yeah, I, I gotta thank, um, first of all, I gotta thank Dr. Mas Masterson, James F. Masterson. He kind of uh, started this uh, because prior to this current batch of videos that we're doing on the PPD pattern, uh, just we just finished a previous set of videos on the talionic feeling that Masterson talks about it in relation to a client of his who had the BPD pattern. So I thought the natural thing to do was, well, let's focus on the BPD pattern. Let's, let's look more into it. So yeah, we'll, we'll uh, read today's quotes on the BPD pattern. And there'll be another video. We'll do um, 2791. We'll, we'll also be on the BPD pattern. And then I think I'll give it a rest uh, for the time being after that. People, there's all sorts of... Long ago, are they hysteric? Are they schizophrenic? Are they like in the border of the bipolar? Like, are they like psychotic? Are they... Are they, psychotic, are they psychotically neurotic? Are they neurotically psychotic? You know, there's this whole confusion. Is it disassociation? Is it, is it just constantly feeling that, that you're always in this mode of being reminded of the pain of mother not meeting any of your needs, really? To be seen and held and accepted and so on. So we'll, we'll post those quotes in a minute. Our, our, our temporary linked song for the BPD pattern, it's called Borderline. It's not about the psychology of the borderline psychology. It's just a nice song uh, by Ange, the singer Anne Shell. A very, oh my God, what a great singer, Anne Shell. We've got a, about eight or nine of her songs on our soundtrack, Anne Shell. One of them is called um, Borderline from her album. Her, my favorite album of hers is uh, Betty's Garden, Betty's Garden. Uh, I think it's the second last track. The second last track on that CD is called Borderline. It, it just means like, it's about a relationship uh, where the couple was arguing and they were kind of on the borderline of deciding whether to stay or to break up kind of thing. And then she was calling all angels, let's pray for these people, help them to mentalize and have empathy for themselves and others, calling all angels because they're on the borderline like this. So she was praying to help save a couple kind of thing. So that, that's, they only, it only meant it like that. So although that song is not specifically about BPD, um, it is called Borderline, so I'm just gonna, it's a good song as well. And it's by one of our musical voices, Ann Shell. So for the time being, until I find a better song about the BPD pattern, I'm just gonna temporarily go with that one for the time being. It's an, it's an undeveloped thread. We don't have too many quotes in the BPD pattern. Uh, it's undeveloped, so I'm, I'm glad we're posting some today as well. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's, that's the, that record that we're talking about. If the person has a stinger personality pattern, in new situations, they find proxies to cry for love, like the way they cry for love in their imagination, they're crying for love. So it's easy if they're vulnerable, if they're safe, if they're innocent, or if they're, if they're disadvantaged or something. Usually it's a non-threatening substitute other. You find them non-threatening. They're, they're nice people or they're, they're, they're codependents or they're pleasers or caretakers or they're safe authority figures or however it is you find them safe kind of thing. Oh, okay, you feel safe. When you feel safe, you project. So you project your, your, your innocence to them because they're kind of safe and so you feel safe to do that. Remember, you, you, ha you only see your projection. You have this compulsion to cry for love. So you can cry for love. You are crying for love, but you don't want to feel the cry for love because you don't want to feel the pain of mother hurting you. And now you're, the, now you're your own mother who's hurting you. So how do you deal with this? You're going to be your own mother who hurts you? Oh my God. So emotional triangle. Murray Bowen talks about the emotional triangle. 
so you scapegoat somebody. So the non-threatening other is kind of pulled in like a scapegoat phenomenon. So the scapegoat serves as a proxy for your unloved self. So if the scapegoat plays your childlike place, okay, you're replaying the original theme, scene in the nursery where the person as a baby was vulnerable and innocent and non-threatening, crying for the mother, I need your love, and the aggressive monster mother shamed him and said no. So you, you recreate that. The proxy cries for love, you play the mother who says no to the proxy. So that's called scapegoating, it's called prejudice, and so on. So only very abused uh, people project like this. And uh, um, so prejudice, of course, is a sign of uh, projection and abuse and being abused and all this. The natural state of affairs is I'm okay, you're okay. We're all members of Homo Trauma Cast, we're all one family. We, we all share this, we all enjoy the same myths and fairy tales. Because myths and fairy tales from any place around the world, in any language, in any scenery, in any place, any time, all of these, all of the motifs, they're all patterns for psychology. So we all have the same psychology. We all have the same needs. Every baby has the same need. Every baby in any place in the world, it, and, and any uh, a Navajo baby, baby in the Navajo culture, a baby in Inuit culture, a baby in, um, uh, in in the North Pole, South Pole, any continent, where any baby anywhere, any place, any time, any culture, anywhere, all babies have the same basic primal need. It's called a secure attachment style. Five, part, five parts to it, it takes 10 hours to run through the five parts. The table of contents, I can say here, the table of contents is part one, paradise in the uterus. Meaning the mother doesn't smoke or drink or take caffeine and upset the baby's physiology. And mother doesn't take pills and stuff like that. It's gonna hurt the baby's brain and whack the baby's brain. So he, now he's, now the baby is fighting with the sea monster because his rage he puts onto the cord and three veins and placenta creates a sea monster. So the baby's has, uh, the baby's experiencing prenatal distress syndrome. He's not in paradise if he's fighting with the sea monster. Meaning he projects his rage onto the cord and makes, and sees the cord as a monster. He's not, he's not in paradise. So mothers give the babies paradise. Number two, natural birth. Oh my God, that's a 10 hour topic. So we talk about um, Le Boyer, okay, 1975 famous book, Le Boyer, birth without violence. So mothers do everything they can in preparation for that. Klaus and Kennel, about the time sensitivity at the moment of birth of when the mother produces lots of hormones to help the facilitating lotus birth. Leave the cord, leave the placenta, no scale, don't remove them. Hand the baby to the mother. The position, some positions help the mother cooperate with gravity and the contractions and allowing her to tilt the tailbone to uh, so there's a whole time I don't that's undeveloped that one there my disclaimer I'm not a doctor and all this um, so um, okay and then part three the blissful oneness skin to skin natural feeling mother's loving gaze so Dorina Pines and Mary Ayers and so on and then Margaret Mahler's work so from uh, four to five months to 18 months, okay, the child needs to be allowed to think he rules the world. The world is his oyster. Don't rebuff him for it. Don't hurt him for it. Admire it. Let, let him look at him like he's a little god like that, whatever. Admire it. Oh, how wonderful. I see you. How amazing. That, that's awesome. How wonderful you are. I see you. You did it. That's great. Okay, and then from 18 months to 36 months, the final one there, the fifth one there, called Now Voyager. Now void your face. Now void your seek that forth and find yourself. Now, now the grandiosity and vital megalomania have dissipated. Now he's in the more human realm of being an explorer. The main message being that the child can learn and not be punished for it. Because some mothers freak out here at this time. Some mothers don't mind up until 18 months. But some mothers think, wait a minute. If the child learns, he's not going to need me anymore. I'll be alone. She'll be abandoned. She'll, she'll be abandoned again. She doesn't want to be abandoned again. Her mother abandoned her. Now her child's going to abandon her. So she brainwashes the child. So what she does is the child learns something and, and poo-poo's on it, right? I mean, like puts it down or something or blames him or criticizes him for it or says, I'm not going to love you if you know something here. Whoa. 
baby's crying. Oh, here's your cookie. Whoa, okay, that, that's, very, that's child abuse also. So there's child abuse in the womb. Janov talks about how some mothers are abusing their own babies while they're inside. So there's, there's a thing called knowledge of the womb. So we don't want child abuse in the womb. We don't want prenatal trauma. Okay, part two, we don't want birth trauma. We don't want uh, trauma in the first four to five months, uh, from birth to the first four to five months. And we don't want trauma from four to five months to 18 months, part four, part five. The rapprochement phase from 18 months to 36 months, likewise, babies are meant to get the message that they can know themselves and not lose their mother in the process of doing so. This is just a table of contents that I ran through you. Each one of those five points can take two hours easily. There's so much there. So that's what's called a secure attachment style. So all babies all around the world have a need for a secure attachment style. That's the commonality. Now, now a lot of babies are not getting it. Hence all these fit, hence the, the shrinks came on the scene. Now long ago the shrinks were called storytellers. They would tell stories to validate you know, this. Give us some acceptance, give us some empathy and validation of what happened and you feel seen, you feel better if someone identifies that you were traumatized. So the story about goddess and demon. Well, baby copes with trauma by splitting the mother and the goddess and demon. Okay, again, a breastfeeding for the baby is a matter of heaven and hell. Baby, babies need a blissful oneness. If he's breastfeeding normally, he's in heaven. That's all good. Mother's a goddess. Mother does it wrong. He can't handle that ambivalence. He can't accept something other than perfect paradise. So he, he, he's enraged, makes the mother a monster, says he's in hell, splits it, hallucinates a goddess, and the, and the brain is heaven and hell. So storytellers, well, the myths and fairy tales, a common motif in myths and fairy tales is the good witch, bad, good fairy, bad witch motif. A splitting mechanism. So you'll find that you'll find that motif pretty much in almost every story where of some kind of witch or demon character versus some good fairy godmother, some helpful goddess kind of character. That's that's the that's the brain, that's what's going on in child's brain. There's two there. No, mother's one. Baby never got it. Splits it. That's how he handles it. Okay, repression. Okay, how he pressed down his gold his uh, well, the gold of the ball goes down the well. That's his feelings went down the well. Okay, his identity went pulled down. That's his core. Earth opened up, his core got pulled down. Another mo famous motif. Or the baby's put on a little boat, pushed in a... placed on a little kind of raft or something and pushed down the river to another land. That's, that means our innocence is lost. That's called another repression. Joy and sadness is getting zooped away. Similar one. And the, the, the variations of this are infinite. There's, there's uh, hundreds, thousands of ways to describe uh, splitting and repression and uh, double thinking. Uh, the timelessness of it all. And, uh, some, some more, more guests are coming in. Yeah, to my surprise, it's not uh, not that busy today. Oh, today's lucky. I'm I'm I, yeah. I'm, I'm glad I came here today. It, it's getting harder and harder to make it out here without being. Um, I once came here. I walked here almost an hour. I was really drenched in sweat, and uh, I couldn't cool off. <laughs> I couldn't do the. <laughs> I ended up walking back. I, I couldn't do the video, it's just so I was just so sweaty. And the nearest mall is sort of like another kilometer down down that way to cool off to the go to the mall, right? And the nearby hotels, you go in there, they want you to buy something, but I can't do a video there, so. What's the point of going there? Uh, taxis, the price of taxis really adds up quickly, so I've stopped that. Yeah. Okay, enough about my logistics. I want to get these quotes out. I want to get these quotes out. Uh, I, I think this is um, going to last for a long time. I think this is an amazing collection. I feel kind of excited or. 
honor or something to help have this ten, have these 10,000 quotes all in one file. It can be on anybody's phone. It's, it's just for a minor admin fee, uh, just for a minimal tiny admin fee. Um, so yeah, the link is below, the copy page link is below. Uh, and now with these psychology books being removed, uh, these quotes are going to be harder and harder to find. All the more valuable these quotes are. I'm not the author of these quotes. The name of the author is given. It's all educational. Uh, it's all about heal healing our soul. So this, this, I really think everybody over 40 uh, will benefit uh, at some time in their lives over 40. Or, or that moment they get a symptom and say, what's going on here? Like a, like a psychosomatic symptom. A lot of people get a psychosomatic symptom at midlife. That, that's a sign that they've been denying their feelings. They went to the body and it blistered out in the body and the body's crying. And they're still crying for love. Now you gotta be aware of it. Till lay the ghost to rest. Now the life force can be for the present once you lay the ghost to rest, kind of thing. And Lowell's metaphor. You wanna give the past, you wanna capture the past, give it a time and a place and lay the ghost to rest. Then the life force is free for the present. Once again, if the child has a painful past, he's not gonna love life in the present. You might think, well, what's the big deal? He had a traumatized past. Just forget it and love life in the present. You don't have the psychic structure to love life in the present. To, have, to love life in the present, the psychic structure is called differentiation. I'm okay, you're okay, whole object relations of having been loved. And the ego is there to know your uniqueness and your embodiment, your golden ball. To get that psychic structure, you gotta be loved to get there. So if you don't get the love to get that, uh, you're stuck in the past with this constant unfinished business unfinished struggle business with the mother which you're going to transfer to the present because you're still in the past to get those needs met but post age three it can never be done so you got to mourn and accept that you didn't get okay, the death of unreal hope the death of this relentless unreal hope is the birth of this new life so you got the mourning process to do the mourning process you need these ten thousand quotes or 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 any other uh, or any other uh, psychological kind of oh oh that's the bird oh no it's a kid oh it's a kid oh sorry okay let's 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 give the kids some play there hold on i thought that sound was the bird it's a kid Now just give me one minute here. We have a whole thread on the splitting defense. Okay, we have another whole thread on projective identification. Another one on identification with the aggressor. Okay, and then um, and and th those are sort of the basics to understand the BPD psychology. So why don't we um, before we read today's batch, let me just uh, do a quick partial um, recap of what we covered so far. Let's see. Let's do it this way.
Borderline mothers have difficulty allowing their children to, to grow up. So Lawson gave the example of the the unicorn, the, the story about called the unicorn in, in the garden, as a sort of a a reference to approximate uh, the, the chaos of, of the craziness of the mind uh, of, the, of those with the BPD pattern. So people generally say they feel crazy around them. They make you feel crazy. Uh, they gaslight you. They deny. They flip. They blame. Okay, it's just their survival anxiety. So she gave the example of James Thurber's 1931 comical tale, The Unicorn in the Garden. This tale depicts uh, the battle for sanity experienced all too frequently by children of borderlines. By children... Okay, this, this problem with labeling, I also don't like the labeling, but it's hard to, it's hard to avoid it. Um, children of mothers with the borderline mind, let's say. The, these mothers, uh, their children, the, uh, the children of these mothers often feel like characters in Mr. Thurber's tale. Sometimes they feel like the husband, hoping to share their excitement and wonder, but are discredited, discounted, shamed, disbelieved, etc. At other times, uh, they feel like the wife, fed up with wild stories, fabrication, etc. Regardless, regardless of which way they turn, in the emotional labyrinth, they end up feeling crazy, the kids. So just an abbreviation of it is, so the metaphor for how the child feels. So the, it, it's, it's about how the child feels. But the story is um, a couple living in a very uh, fancy house, a very wealthy couple, just a husband and wife. Um, and they got this massive, um, beautiful garden in the backyard. Uh, the husband, uh, one day the husband is uh, in the backyard and um, sees a unicorn. He goes, whoa, that's amazing. How exciting. He runs, charges into the house, runs upstairs to where his wife was still sleeping, wakes her up, hey darling, there's a unicorn in the backyard. You gotta see, check it out. And she says, you're nuts. You belong in the nut house. Uh, there are no unicorns. You're how annoying. Uh, so he, she rebuffs him. He goes downstairs. He goes, back to the back, he goes back to the backyard. And again, sees the unicorn. This time, um, he feeds the unicorn, gives it some food. He has a close look and sees the golden horn on the unicorn. Whoa, he's all excited again. Runs into the house, runs upstairs, Wakes up his wife, no really darling, uh, I fed it, I saw the golden horn, you gotta believe me here. Okay, okay, this, you're, this is too much here, I can't take this anymore. Um, you're, you're really nuts here. And secretly, oh yeah, really? Hmm. Okay, so, okay, and then uh, he goes away kind of thing. The, the wife picks up the phone and calls uh, 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 the shrink hospital or something. Um, calls the, the psych, uh, the nut house or something. Hey, nut house! <laughs> I've got a nut in my house. Uh, help! This, I think he's dangerous. He, he's seeing, he's, he's getting delusions. He's crazy here. Um, so a, few, a little while later, um, a shrink and, and a cop uh, show up at the house. And the shrink uh, approaches the, the guy there and says, uh, I'm curious here, did you... Uh, tell your wife that you saw a unicorn? What? Wow, well, that's an incredible thing to say. Unicorns are fantasy, they're in stories. So what are you talking about? Yeah, I thought, yeah, okay. The this, 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 this shrink thought about it for a minute and said to the cop, grab her. She's a nut. We're going to bring her to the nut house. And you can see the husband getting his revenge kind of thing. So it's a sort of a sad story, a slightly uh, psychological thriller or whatever, painful kind of story. I don't like. I don't like. I don't like this story, honestly speaking. But the idea was, when the child has enthusiasm and exuberance, and he's in the now voyager phase. Remember part five, the now voyager phase, where he's discovering and learning things. 
Mommy, look what I found. And the mother says, don't bother me. I'm busy here. That's nonsense. What are you talking about? That's foolish. Because she doesn't want that child to grow up. She wants to brainwash that child to be dependent on her, to parentify the child so that the mother never feels alone, always has someone at her beck and call, always has someone she can trigger and control so she doesn't feel alone and abandoned. That child's gonna be very enraged by this. Hence that the guy was saying, oh yeah? So now that child has a kind of hate towards his mother, let's say. So he wants to get back at his mother, so to speak. So in the story, he did it. The guy, standing in for the child, got back. The mother was the nut. So from the child's point of view, I'm not crazy. You're the nut. You're supposed to um, be a mother and, and support my development here. And you can't do that. There's something wrong with you. You're the nut. You belong in the nut house. Man. That, that's the kind of thing. So that's a sad story. Um, let's not talk too much about it. Children. Um, well, how do we wrap it up here? So you, you can imagine inside the mind, like you, you can imagine inside the mind, the mother gaslights the baby. Baby identifies, baby identifies with the aggressor and feels the same frustration that the mother felt if others say things. So this, this is sort of like the craziness of the, of the borderland mind. Alice in Wonderland mind, the emotionality that she called the borderland mind. Children of mothers with the borderline pattern cannot understand themselves without first understanding, understanding their mothers. So adults who grew up with this, if they're gonna heal themselves, you first gotta be a detective to understand why your mother did that way, you know, why your mother treated you that way. The, in order to heal ourselves, okay, a lot of shrinks say, first be a detective and understand why did your mother do this? Why did she behave like this? Why was she in survival anxiety? Was she crying for love? Was she shaming to say that she was shamed? Was she parentifying the child? Um, so have some empathy uh, and understanding for the mother okay, and then you heal yourself. Understand your mother, heal yourself. That's the true meaning of the phrase, honor your parents. Okay, that tr uh, Barry Grosskopf, uh, he says the true, genuine, psychological meaning of that phrase, honor your parents, means know their story. If you know their story, honestly, you're honoring them. You're seeing them. And if you see them honestly, you understand yourself. Why they behaved the way they did. That leads to empathy and understanding. So uh, one shrink said to the BPD client, why are you trying to make me afraid of losing you? So that's just a, a typical tactic. They have immense fears of abandonment. So they want the other one to feel afraid of being abandoned. So they're trying to make others feel what they're feeling. Thinking if they feel what you're feeling, then you're back in the nursery. You're one with the mother. If you're one with the mother, that means your mother's feeling what you're feeling. If mother's feeling what you're feeling, this time maybe finally, She'll soothe you because, she know, because she's attuned. So you're trying to create the attunement with others because you're still in the past. If the child cannot leave the primitive perception of the mother and continue his psychic growth, he will be devoured by her. This fantasy, okay, it's a fantasy, derives from such fundamental longings as the child's desire to be independent, and the mother's desire to hold on to him. Okay, we mentioned before about the body bears the burden. So at midlife, um, if we can't cry and get a response, the body bears the burden. The truth about our childhood is stored up in our body. And although we can repress it, we can never alter it. Our intellect can be deceived, feelings manipulated, perceptions confused, 
and our body tricked with medication, but someday the body will present its bill. The body speaks for the soul if the soul doesn't find a voice. A nice tag team there between Alice Miller and Christine Lawson there. Brundle characterized borderline, board, uh, Brundle, um, Brendel, sorry, characterized BPD by instability of affect, intensive affect states, and behavioral impulsivity. Those are sort of the main three, right? The be impulsive behavior, the moods are intense, and they switch a lot. So intense moods, exaggerated, intense intensity of moods, which can flip and switch, and the acting out of being impulsive, harmful to self and others. This is because there wasn't a secure attachment style. As a result of hypersens as a result of hypersensitivity of the attachment process, clients with BPD are vulnerable to losses. Of mentalizing in the context of attachment relationships. So this ability to have, this ability to understand yourself and others, some people call a mental the mentalizing capacity or something. It's called secondary process mentation usually. BPD can be a consequence of a traumatic child-parent relationship in which there is no secure attachment, and this prevents the interjection of the alpha function. So if the, if the mother has soul vision and understanding for the baby, her reverie and her attunement for the baby, she's considered to have what's called secondary mentation, mentalizing capacity, self-reflecting capacity. One jargon is the alpha function. Okay? The emotions uh, the baby has is the beta elements or the beta function or primary process mentation. A little bit of jargon here, right? So traditionally it's primary process, secondary process. Shrinks have good secondary process. Clients are missing it. Their secondary process is all frazzled up like the straw house. The shrinks have a strong ego, that's the brick house. So we want to get the straw house up to the brick house like the children's story. It is posited that in individuals with BPD, as in the early stages of normal development, the views of self and other in each of these pairings are simplistic and exaggerated in contrast to the richness and complexity that characterizes the corresponding views formed in the course of successful psychological development. So it's simplistic and exaggerated. Baby's a goddess. Baby thinks he's a little, little god, all good. His unloved self is all bad. I'm okay, you're not okay. Simplistic, exaggerated. I do, useful or not useful? The yardstick, the yardstick's impossible. The infantile yardstick's impossible because nothing can be the perfect breast experience that was needed back in the nursery. So it's, it's simplistic. Well, it's no good. They devalue everything because nothing's perfect enough to invent a time machine and change the past. So everything's no good because they felt no good by the mother. They felt like the narcissist flower, self-sufficient superiority on the throne. So I'm on the throne and you, you're a humanist, my humanist is no good. So it's kind of simplistic like that, binary thinking like that. Children's emotional needs. Well, they have emotional needs. They need safe, warm, loving arms. That's called a positive holding environment, maternal holding environment to be held and all this. Mirrored, you know, to be seen and all this. But the mother with the BPD mind projects her shame self into the child. That, that makes her feel strong. If the mother uses her own baby as a proxy for her baby place in the nursery and sees her memory of her being a baby 
and places that memory, puts it into the baby, and the baby plays that for her. Well, what's left? She can be the mother who shamed her. So she shames the baby, she feels strong. It's not a real strength, it's a... It's called emotional sadism as a defense against emotional masochism or the superiority complex against the underlying shame self. It's not, it's not a genuine strength. It's the strength of uh, infantile megalomania, of you being in a blissful oneness with the mother. So when the baby's in a blissful oneness with the mother, the power of the mother, the little baby thinks is his power. So if he acts like her, he feels quote unquote strong. Clients with BPD often use projective identification by which painful self-experiences are projected onto the therapist and combined with efforts to control the therapist's behavior and experience. It's the same idea. My understanding of BPD is that they suffer from um, deficits in self-maintenance capacities. Yeah, so the mother didn't soothe them, they can't soothe themselves, basically. Um, okay, regarding the, the bully version of the BPD, the more aggressive, belligerent bully one, right? Like the Queen of Hearts and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the bo so Lawson calls the bully one the queen one. The borderline queen treats people as if they were cards to be shuffled, arranged, stacked, so she can win. She exploits others without remorse, envious, competitive, longing for glamour, wealth, attention, fame, advert, etc. The common denominator among borderline queens is emotional deprivation. As children, they felt robbed. Therefore, they feel entitled to take what they need. They relate to others with an air of detachment and superficiality. Yeah, I'm not going to do the example about the Crawford example, so let's skip that one. Of the four profiles of BPD in women, the witch is least likely to seek treatment. Her self-loathing prevents uh, she, she just, she only wants, she doesn't want to be healed or helped. She's just, she's just too enraged um, and, and wants to still try to change the mother to be a good mother. The aggression around that is she's so enraged that she was destroyed by the mother. So she wants to destroy others, so to speak, thinking that's the only way she can change or coerce uh, the mother to be a loving mother. So she's so enraged like this, right? Like the witch in Hansel and Gretel, the borderline, the mother with the borderline psychology has a keen sense of smell for human weakness. Which mothers know what to say to hurt or scare their children and use humiliation and degradation to punish them? So they're in a state of fusion, hypersensitivity. They instantly know uh, your vulnerability, what to say to hurt, or you, they know where your open wound is and they'll pour salt on it. Like they're, they're so, um, uh, they're filled with talionic feelings, they're filled with vindictiveness and revenge for the witch one. So for example, she may uh, betray the secrets of her children, mock them. It's hard to believe that some mothers treat their children like this. These mothers only care about their pride. The Median mother cares about her pride and she'll sacrifice the soul of her own child for her pride. The need for power and control over others, the need to elicit a response of fear. Yeah, so these witch mothers, borderline witch mothers, their, their only sense of kind of identity is if they see someone else scared. Oh, they got a reaction, they're scared. Well, when they were a baby, they were scared. They identify with the scaring mother. So they have an identity if the proxy shows what they felt. That's their only identity kind of thing. 
just as the diabetic must learn to manage sugar intake and output, the individual with BPD must learn to manage emotional input and output. Yeah, so the famous doc Dr. Banting and Best, right? Banting and Best. The two doctors uh, discovered uh, insulin, is that right? Well, BPD um, is a kind of a, an emotional diabetes with emotions. Instead of sugar, it's with emotions. So shrinks like Masterson and Rinsley and Otto Kernberg and James Grostein, uh, they're the banting and best for the BPD pattern, for the treatment of BPD. So what banting and best did uh, in, in in inventing uh, insulin for those with diabetes, the shrinks have done uh, in inventing some kind of understanding to help those with the BPD issue. Yeah, that's back to this uh, lawsuit. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, yeah. Well, that's, that's enough with this lawsuit. I'm kind of. Now her book's a little triggering. Her book's a little witchy. She she kind of she, she's a bit witchy in her book, I think, with all of her examples. She she picks the worst examples. Okay, next one here. BPD, like PTSD, may be the natural consequence of the brain's response to emotional stress. So think about that. So PTSD, we know it's about the physiology of the shock trauma. Well, the BPD. It's kind of like the same thing in terms of relationships, about needs and being seen and held and loved and having self-agency and all that. Trust is a major issue between mothers with the BPD psychology and their children. Children cannot trust their borderline mother for many reasons. She's manipulative, she distorts the truth and may even blatantly lie overreacts, impulsive, unpredictable, poor judgment, unreliable memory, inconsistent, intrusive. Like Alice who confided in the cat, children of these borderline mothers may learn to trust the pet more than their own mother. Hence all the tears people are shedding out watching these clips of people with their pets. A lot of people, a lot of people have said this. The first time they felt Maybe of what a mother should have been like is with their pet. This warm, unconditional presence. A lot, lot of children not getting that. A lot of children direct their talionic rage with their mother and direct it covertly to the child. Can you believe it? And then those children go up and direct it onto Mother Earth. So, so now the Earth is being plundered and pillaged in a talionic feeling towards the Earth. You see, it's getting dispersed like this, right? In, in ancient days, it was uh, kind of in your face, I guess. Then it kind of went underground, which is an improvement, of course. No one would, no one would disagree with that. But now it's kind of sneaky. Now it's being a little more sneaky. So when a mother's alone with the baby, uh, no one's watching. She might, uh, pr she might refuse to breastfeed. Here, take the powder stuff. Because she wants to go to the office and use her newfound seductive power to have power over the fellows of the office. That's talionic towards the child. She's not seeing the needs of the child and doesn't care because she, she's still uh, wanting to control the people at the office, the people at the office being symbols of mother, and she wants power over mother. So she'll reject uh, her own child to that end. So she's talionic to her child, talionic towards the guys at the office. The husband, uh, the husband said, what are you doing, darling? Why aren't you breastfeeding our baby here? Oh no, I like my new appearance here. The guys are all gaga. Uh, I feel this power, it's, it's so exciting. I can have power of these guys. I can do what I want now. Before they mocked me, now they're all gaga. But you're gonna abuse our child and give our child um, uh, trauma for the rest of his life for this? And he said, that guy reported, that was the beginning of the end of their marriage because he thought to himself in that moment that he had no idea what a rotten mother, uh, what an abusive, cruel mother his wife was. Yeah. 
Interesting quote. I remember that from three years ago. Uh, if you look up three years ago, uh, that quote's in there about that. Our children of mothers with a borderline mind never know from one minute to the next how their mother feels about them. Like a game of she loves me, she loves me not, the mother's moods can suddenly change from affection to rage, creating an uncertain and insecure emotional environment. Winnicott emphasized the importance of the child's need for the good enough mother who provides enough consistency and calmness so that the child is not overwhelmed, overwhelmed with anxiety. Without structure and predictability in their emotional world, children have no reality base upon which to build their, themselves. Children with uh, mothers who have a borderline mindset face a basic conflict. Their attachment to mother is needed for survival. Yet, if a mother is a threat to survival, the brain must protect the child from recognizing this. Failing to integrate contradictory experiences of the good and the bad mother reduces the anxiety because the image of the good mother is preserved at the expense of the child's positive. Okay. So how the child copes, how does the child adapt? What kind of compromise he's got to make if the mother's abusing him? Deny that's his mother, make it up that she's a witch and that's not his mother. Hallucinate a goddess, oh there's my mother. Believes the lie and uh, denies the truth. That's called splitting. And it's binary, it's either or, and it's simplistic like that. The splitting defense results in a variety of neurological effects. As Kernberg85 points out, although, although this type of defense may reduce anxiety in children, so children reduce their anxiety this way, but these very same children can grow up with the BPD psychology. So splitting and is, a main, is a main feature of the BPD because they're flipping all the time. And see, another issue is if the child were to admit that the mother hurt him and try to heal the splits, he couldn't do it because the feeling is he had no mother. He can't admit that he had no loving mother, so he maintains the split. Okay, part of, part of this is uh, push-pull dynamics. So yes, people with the BPD pattern do have an unconscious need to draw people in, uh, but the moment they do so, they gotta reject it. Immense fears of engulfment, immense fears of abandonment, the push-pull dynamics. So, that, that, so I'll leave that quote. That, let's not do the full, let's not do all. Let's, I'm not gonna read all of them here. Those with the BPD pattern can only see the ends of the spectrum. Thus, their inability to experience more than one perspective at a time conveys only one side of the story only one side of the picture. So they can't see the two, they can't hold the third side of the coin. They can't recognize. The, the prototype in the brain is either or. So later in life, they never want to see the two sides of the story. They can't do it, because it would bring up the pain of originally, of why they could never see their mother as one person. The baby never had one human loving mother with, and where the child could see that she's partly loving, partly frustrating. He couldn't get to that place. She was too painful, so he splits. So later in life, if the cognitive style is either or thinking, all or nothing thinking, black or white thinking, perfect or forget it, now or never, everything or nothing, these kind of binary kind of things, they're adamant about it, because that's, that's the template in the brain, if they see things like that. Now, by the way, either or thinking, binary thinking, is, is a clue that there's trauma, that as a baby, they never got to a place where they could recognize their mother as one human person with different sides to her that he can tolerate and accept the ambivalence of. He could never reach that place of accepting ambivalence um, because it was too painful to be able to hold the two sides of the coin, to hold the two sides. So if it's too painful, he didn't get to that place a place he can only reach. If the mother is basically more loving than painful, then he's, then he, then he just keeps it split. I have no, me I have no memory of mother loving me 
for me to reach the reality that she's one person who's loving and frustrating. She's just too painful. I gotta make her as a monster tonight and who's in the goddess and easy peasy split, you see. So later on when people have prejudice and either or thinking, it's coming from that psychic structure of the traumatized mind like that. So splitting is a major phenomenon in uh, the sting of personality patterns. Messages from the, the BPD bully or queen she calls it. Some of her slogans are, well, never enough, never good enough. I deserve more, rules don't apply to me, I'm special, I resent, I re you need something from me, I resent that. The borderline queens, the borderline queens, uh, sorry, the borderline queen experiences what shrinks call oral greediness, oral greed. The desperate hunger of the borderline queen is akin to the baby, is akin to the behavior of an infant or baby who has gone too long between feedings starved, frustrated, and beyond the ability, the ability to calm or soothe herself, she grabs, flails, and wails until at last the nipple is planted securely and perhaps too deeply in her mouth. She coughs, gags, chokes, spits, eyeing the elusive breast like a wolf guarding her food. Similarly, the queen holds on to what is hers, taking more she can, just in case the nipple will be taken away prematurely. So look at, look at the prototype, right? The mother uh, wants to hurt her baby. So feeds a little bit. Oh, I'll get, I'll get my revenge on my mother. All right, baby, so she withdraws the nipple. Baby, oh, the baby's freaking out. I'm, gonna, I'm not enough here, I'm not, I'm not satiated here. I'm still hungry here, what are you doing? Well, the mother was talionic to the baby, but the baby was left with the memory that it was prematurely removed. And that's a template. So they go through life being greedy and hoarding and hoarding and being greedy and being hoarding. Never enough, never good enough, never enough. And they're hoarding in case, just in case, the nipple's gonna be removed too prematurely. So in life they, go, they grab and flail and hoard. And, so that's why they're like the bullying, they're grabbing, they're like, they're like screaming babies, mother, uh, Please provide um, the nipple, the breast, uh, properly and securely. Uh, don't use your breast uh, uh, in your, uh, as a tool in your anger against me. I'm not your mother who hurt you. I'm your baby who needs your love. But the mother says, "Sorry, I don't see you for who you are. I only see you as my mother who hurt me, and I'm getting back at her. So I'm going to control you because I think you're my mother. And if and if you're my mother, maybe I can I can get my anger on her. Sorry, baby, that you got to play her." But I see you as her, and I want my mother to change her ways. So I'm, I'm immensely angry at my mother. So I'm going to take that anger. I'm going to I'm going to transfer that anger towards my mother to you, baby. It's called displacement. So it's, you know, it's wrongly placed. This place wrongly placed. It's called transfer. And the baby's saying, "What are you doing, mother? Stop this, please." Mother says, "I only I only see the struggle with my mother. I have a memory of my, of mother hurting me." and I'm angry at her. You're gonna play my mother and I'm angry at you. Mother, I'm not, I'm not your mother. So you can, see the, you can see how crazy making this is if someone has a mind like this. Early sessions with a client with the BPD pattern can be like walking through a house of mirrors in search of someone. There is a now you see it, now you don't, catch me if you can, quality to what the client is trying to communicate. Yeah, so as mentioned before, now you see it, now you don't, catch me if you can, ha ha. So they, they'll flip it, they'll twist it. If the other person says something, they'll just imagine that they said it. What the person with the BPD person said, the rude thing, the first person said, they'll behave and believe the other person just said it. How can, how can you say such a thing? What are you talking about? You just said it. Oh, you said it. The flip, it's, it's now you see it, now you don't. Catch me if you can. Clients with this psychology pattern may change subjects frequently, often several times within a session, and their presentations will be laced with lapses and silences premature conclusions, unexpected intrusion of unrelated events, 
emotional traps, stony silence. Therapists may have to endure a confusing variety of complaints. Many about the therapist, alternating with rapid changes of affect and repeated reversals by the client on important subjects. There is little to get hold of with any certainty in any, any such sessions. He shrink gets to the point where he doesn't know if it's a drama or if he's really feeling it. So the shrinks finally have to say, what are you feeling? What feelings uh, impel you to rattle on like this? Okay, I'm not, the next one, okay, project, I'll, I'll leave you to look up projective identification. Children who grew up with mothers with the BPD uh, issue in their heads, in their minds, sorry, live. So these children with, with crazy mothers, basically, traumatized mothers. So children with traumatized mothers. Children with traumatized mothers who develop the BPD pattern live in a make-believe world that is neither fiction nor fantasy. It's borderland. Borderland is an emotional world where mothers resemble storybook characters, helpless waifs, frightened hermits, bossy queens, vindictive witches. Like Alice, uh, children in borderland are puzzled by the contradictions of their world. These mothers use guilt and fear to control their children. The child feels emotionally imprisoned. The child feels unjustly accused. Sentenced without a trial. Remember in Alice in Wonderland, always guilty. So what's the guilt about? Why is it in the unconscious the person has unconscious guilt? One theory is the baby thought it was his job to save the mother and make her be a loving mother. No baby can do it. He failed in his task, so he's guilty. He's not guilty, but he thought that. So enter the Franz Kafka story, the trial. The guy's told that he's guilty. The guy said, what? They don't tell him. The whole story is about his anxiety about what's he guilty of. The metaphor is the child feels guilty, doesn't know what. No, it's no job. It's no baby's job to save the mother, make her be a loving mother. But he's got to try to have a loving mother. Plus, he feels shame because he thinks he's defective, because he, he failed in his task, maybe because he's no good. So now it's guilt and shame. Where are we here? Ernest Wolf 88 explains that merger hungry personalities need to control others completely. The borderline witch's merger hungry personality leaves her children feeling devoured, suffocated, oppressed, etc. Okay, here's my favorite one by Miss Lawson here. Let's just, let's just take the premise that mothers with the BPD mind really do love their children the same like healthy mothers or ordinary mothers or other mothers, okay, just in general. Let's just take that as a premise. You don't see it if they're acting like a witch or something like that. But let's say they really do love, let's say somehow we take the premise uh, that the bully mother really loves her daughter. Just take that as a premise. Although borderline mothers may love their children as much as other mothers, their deficits in cognitive functioning and emotional regulation create behaviors that undo their love. There it is, it undoes it. Borderline mothers have difficulty loving their children patiently and consistently because their love, their love doesn't endure misunderstandings, disagreements, little things, mountain out of molehill, paranoia projections, like they, they can't endure little things. Mother, the, most borderline mothers say, if you're gonna be autonomous, you're betraying me. You're disloyal. With me, against, with me or against me, the mother says. If the child's gonna be autonomous, she thinks the child is betraying her. Can you believe it? The child, is born to be himself. Nature's greatest miracle. Life's longing for itself. The great spirit, 
Everyone has an authentic self. The child searches for that by the great spirit. The mother says, what? You're gonna fall, you're gonna be yourself? You're betraying me. You're either with me or there's that with me or against me mentality. Simplistic, exaggerated, extreme. That's the BPD path, the BPD mind. They can be rude, irritable, resentful, arrogant, unforgiving, jealous, etc. Healthy love is based on trust and is the essence of emotional security. Their children therefore, therefore may grow up without knowing the meaning of healthy love. When a borderline feels stressed, um, the habit memory system easily bypasses the cognitive frontal lobe system, i.e. the wolf blows down the house made out of straw. The ego is not strong enough. So the, the, the cognitive frontal lobe influence, you want it to be like a brick house so the emotions don't blow down like the wolf, right? The cognitive style seen in borderlines consists of a lack of focus or attention to the matter at hand. A balanced understanding of an event is impossible to achieve. Yeah. They, they can't do two, they don't do two sides of the story. It's this either or stuff, with me, against me kind of thing. They, they can't see, they don't have the psychic structure in their brain to see the two sides of the story. Or they can, they can, they can mock the idea of two sides of the story, they can make fun of it or something, a sadistic, uh, but they're not genuinely seeing the two sides of the story. Because the psychic structure to do that is what's called differentiation. How does a child differentiate from the mother? He's got to feel safe with her. These babies didn't feel safe with her. If the mother puts rubber on the honey nipple, that's on the rubber nipple. If the mother puts honey on the rubber nipple after the baby's crying, that, that, that traumatizes them. If the mother says, oh, put the baby in a crib, let him cry himself to sleep. That's abuse. That's, a, that's severe abuse. I feel, I feel pain just at that image. If a mother puts a, a one-month-old baby in a crib in a separate room, the baby's screaming and wailing, and the uh, mother says, uh, uh, just leave it alone, let him cry himself to sleep. Uh, that, that's abuse. That's Talionic. She's, she's taking revenge on her mother, using the child, seeing the child, her own baby, as an emotional reincarnation of her mother, and she's taking revenge on her mother, on the child. Okay, when talking with those with the BPD pattern, uh, avoid using the word fear, instead use the word anxiety. Fear, you know, amps up the present feeling, but anxiety implies something in the past that you don't know that happened. What feelings impel you to rattle on? Yeah, so when she's talking incessantly, you can just hold up your hand and say, wait a minute, I can't possibly follow you at this speed. What feelings impel you to rattle on? Okay, that Capex quote, Jay Capex, go to 2784 for that one. Uh, I don't know if it's showing up here, but... Um... Oh, there, yeah, okay, I think that, that's it there, right? Jay Capex. That one there, go, go to uh, 2784. Um, and let's say, and let's say uh, yeah, these, here's another good one by Miss Lawson. Adults, adults, who still idealize their own abusive parents are unable to acknowledge the absurdity of being asked to trust someone you fear. Children of borderline mothers are often told, you know, that's just the way she is. She didn't mean it. She can't help it. She loves you, you know. As if children should ignore their own intuition that tells them that they've been hurt. These messages not only encourage repression, 
but also lead children to believe that this behavior is okay. Something is wrong if we fear the person who loves us. So as adults, trust your intuition. So the message was, when children grow up and they visit the mother on Thanksgiving or something, uh, and you're feeling the hook, you're feeling the bait of the hook and the trick, and she's pushing your buttons, well, trust your intuition now, trust yourself now. Here's uh, one of my favorite ones here by Miss Lawson, uh, quoting Alice Miller. Alice Miller, in 1985, page 32, writes, quote, If a mother could just feel... Oh, I added the word just. If a mother could feel how she is injuring her child, if a mother could feel how, if a mother, if a mother could feel how she is injuring her child, if she can somehow do that, if she can somehow sense or somehow imagine, somehow feel, mentalize, empathy, soul vision, imagine, I don't know, if somehow she can get around, get around to it somehow, if somehow, some way or another, if a mother could somehow feel how she's hurting her child, she would be able to discover how she was once injured herself and so could rid herself of the compulsion to repeat the past. You see? So it can work both ways. If first the mother knows she was hurt, she won't repeat. Or she identifies she's hurting the child. That links her to how she was hurt. She can stop repeating. So when we get the story, we stop repeating. We don't have narrative medicine, we repeat. Story, stop repeating. No story, repeating until we find a story. My, my, still, my favorite quote on this, by the way, is that, one about, is that one about the mother who was about to have a baby. She said to herself, hold the phone here. She went to the shrink guy and he said to her, oh yes, you're letting me know what kind of childhood you had. What do you mean, she said. You're letting me know what kind of mother you had and how it felt being with her. Go on. You're putting me in the role of you and you're acting like her and I feel a kind of tug and a pull to feel what maybe you felt with her. She got it, clicked, emotional knowing, she weeped, she understood the pattern and then later she got the story. So later when she had the baby, she could be a mother for the baby. You see? Because if she didn't get the story beforehand and just had the baby, she would shame the baby the way she was shamed. But her baby can't do what the shrink did. Her baby can't say, Mother, are you shaming me uh, because your mother shamed you? Are you shaming me because you're trying to discover for yourself how your mother shamed you? The baby can't do that. So we've got to get the story first. Parents should want to find out what they are unconsciously doing to their children. Parents should want to find out what they are unconsciously doing to their children. Alice Miller, now. Inconsistency, unpredictability, inappropriate intensity. Because these mothers with the DPD pattern were abused, neglected, or suffered a traumatic loss as children, they are desperately afraid of abandonment. They seek emotional control over, over others, even, even threatening abandonment in order not to be abandoned themselves. So a common trick mothers use. Well, don't do, if you don't do what I say, child, I'm going to leave you here in, in this strange place. The child's terrified. Whoa. Okay, I'm not, uh, there's some, okay, I'm not going to read all of them here. Interactions with mothers with the borderline psychology often leave their children feeling guilty and confused. They may tune out by disassociating and disconnecting from the environment. So they feel unreal, they personally feel unreal, or they feel the environment is unreal. That's called depersonalization and derealization. Children of these borderline mothers have been down the rabbit hole. 
They have attended the mad tea party and argued with the Duchess for the right to think their own thoughts. Brother, I have my own thoughts. My own. No, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. I don't. Gaslighting. The word of the year by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Company for 2022 was gaslighting. Uh, borderline mothers gaslight their children big time. Not, not only borderline mothers. Narcissistic bully. Okay. Iago, etc. This, okay. Um, back to Miss Lawson's four versions of the borderline mother. There, you got the waif, the hermit, the queen, and the witch. The, the waif says, yeah, life is kind of hard, poor me. Now, when Miss Lawson talks about the waif, uh, I think a fault, I think a, what she's missing is uh, she's unknowingly describing two kinds of waifs. There's the clinger and the pleaser wave called the codependent caretaker one. And then you got the clinging vine narcissistic one. That, that's the more stinger wave. But she doesn't distinguish between the two kinds of waves. So the, the codependent wave, um, they're not as harmful. But the stinger wave is, oh yes, they're like a witch basically. The stinger wave is like a kind of a, it, it's kind of like a covert witch version of it. The hermit says, oh, life is too dangerous. The queen says, all about me. And the witch says, I just, that she just wants revenge. But these categories are not designed, but these categories are designed merely to aid identification of the, pro of the BPD pattern. And they are not mutually ex exclusive. So enter the Enneagram. The Enneagram is a little bit helpful here. On the Enneagram, you got the circle with the nine points, right, nine types and the lines there, joining the dots. There's a line that joins the five and the eight. So the eight is the bully one, and the five is the hermit one. There's a line there. If the, if the turtle one, or the hermit one, feels safe, they might be more like the eight. They move to the eight, and, and they're, more op they're more openly like the bully. If the one who's more, the one, the one who's already kind of more openly like the bully, if they feel stressed, they can go back to the hermit one. So the five and eight are like that. Or from the five's point of view, the eight is like a proxy for the five. Likewise with the waif and the witch. I mean the unhealthy waif. So you got the two and the four. On the Enneagram, there's a line there between the two and the four. So if the, the four, the witch, let's say, uh, feels... Uh, Maybe they feel not too bad. Maybe they feel a little better. Maybe they feel safe. Uh, they might kind of withdraw a little bit and be more like the waif. If the waif feels stressed, uh, they might be more witchy. So go to the Enneagram, Helen Palmer, the Wisdom of the Enneagram book by, what's his name, Riso or something? Don Riso, I think, and another guy. Um, okay. um, you got the circle and the nine points and the lines there. So at one point, if, they, if a person feels stressed, they go to one place. If they feel safe, they go to another type. So you study these lines like this. So it's, it kind of fits like this with the five and eight here, okay, the queen and the hermit, five and eight, and um, uh, the smothering, clinging, demanding, pseudo helpful mother under the guise being helpful, controlling like that, the two, um, and the witchy one, the, the eight, the fours. Now we're talking about the, un now the Enneagram types have healthy versions, mid versions, and unhealthy versions. Miss Lawson's model is talking about the unhealthy versions. Okay, so when the waif is like a codependent or a pleaser, uh, she re, she re, re victimizes herself through deprivation and self-sacrificing behavior the hopelessness of the waif who resigns herself to deprivation. So this, this clinger pleaser waif, she says, I'm not okay, you're okay. So she, she helps others and takes care of others, but she doesn't take care of herself. So she's like the waif like that. She lives on crumbs. Uh, the bully queen grabs, uh, the hermit hoards, etc. And the witch destroys.
Now, the unhealthy wave, I think this next quote here is sort of a bit like the unhealthy wave. Like a butterfly caught in strong winds. In social situations, she flits about, never connecting in depth. She can be inappropriately open, enticing others, and then walking away with an air of indifference. She may fish for compliments and then reject them, seek attention and then hide, complain and then refuse help. The waif leaves others feeling helpless. Unconsciously, she needs to stay that way in order to feel safe. Uh, one client said, quote, I can't allow myself to need your help, I'm sorry, because then I can't be in control at the same time. So that's the stinger one, she wants to control it. Uh, the pleasers, no, others can control it, that's okay. That's the difference between uh, the wave. You got the higher functioning wave in the clinger pleaser mode, meaning in new situations, they're not the stinger. They play themselves. Remember that, re okay, so remember that record? There were, there, were two, uh, there, were, there were two ways that record could be played. The stinger way and the clinger way. The higher functioning wave plays it the clinger way. New situations, they play themselves and just coax others to reject them the way their mother rejected them. Now the stingers say no. They find proxies to play their innocence. They play the shaming mother. The proxy cries for love or they, they believe they're crying for love and just shame them because when they were a baby, they were crying for love and mother shamed them, but this time they play the shaming mother. The clingers and the pleasers don't cross over like that. They, they do it more directly. So they're more childlike, they're more waif-like. So the waif is usually sort of in the pleaser caretaker one, right? Um, a little depressed maybe, a little histrionic or something like that, but they don't hurt others. They, they just live on crumbs, they feel no good, and, they, and ironically, they still try to help others and save others, because that's what all children do, they're trying to save others. All babies trying to save the parent, so the wave is still in that mode. Stingers give all, they say, forget that. It's too painful to do that anymore. Uh, so they'll just find proxy to do it, and they'll reject it they've identified with the aggressor. So identification with the aggressor is a more disturbed, uh, perverse phenomenon. Okay, let's not do the Herma one this time here. Yeah, here, yeah, here we go. From the borderline's perspective, lying feels essential to survival. Yeah, so they're always lying, pathological lying. Uh, everything's a lie, basically, with the, B, with the BPD because they're not in touch with their feelings. It's all false self stuff. If it's a lie, if it's a truth, it's a crumb of truth to trick you for a bigger lie, it's a bait. That's the, so they're in survival modality. Unconcerned with the consequences. She feels she has no other option. They don't apologize, why? Because they're in survival mode. Yeah, here's a key one here. Uh, the third last one in 2780, yeah. Okay, go to 2787. Okay, here, 2787, the third last one here. It begins with one clinician. One clinician observed that women who were raised by borderline mothers recreated pathological dynamics with their newborns and that the baby became the mother's own ill parent. That's as clear as it gets. The, the baby, the mother's baby, was seen as the mother's own ill parent. The baby saying, mother, I'm not my grandmother. I'm not your mother. I'm your child here. Mother doesn't see it. She's soul blind. She only sees her struggle with her mother. She only sees her struggle with the mother. So the baby's her mother. And the baby's saying, what are you doing here? This is very painful here. I, I need a mother here. I'm not, I don't, this baby's not having a mother if, if the mother's, if her, if her mother's doing this, obviously. When children, oh yeah, this one's, yeah, this, here's a good, here's a good one by Lawson. I have mixed feelings with Miss Lawson's book here. Parts of it are good. Here's a good one uh, from her. The second last one here in 2787. I like this one. It's not one of these over. It's not one of these uh, over-the-top examples. It's sort of like a daily kind of example that everybody can relate to, I think, or most people can relate to. When children, oh, 
just noticing the guy in front of me uh, just received his, uh, his drinks. He looks happy. Okay. <laughs> okay, when children, when children bring concerns, when children bring concerns to the attention of their mother, one who has the borderline psychology mind, these children receive a response that either increases their distress or their gaslit. A child who is, for example, a child who is worri worried about not passing to the next grade might be told, quote, and then you won't be with your friends your own age. You'll be behind forever. Why didn't you study harder this year? Ouch, right? Unquote. The borderline absorbs and intensifies the child's fear. Quote, and then this and this could happen, unquote. And is unable to reassure and comfort the child. Glick off cues and Melman. 1980-1998 report that daughters of borderline mothers all reported painful memories of turning to their mother for comfort and feeling worse afterwards. You felt worse. You try to say something to the mother and she intensifies your fear, exaggerates your fear. Why? Because she can't soothe her feelings. You see, she's symbiotic. The child has a feeling, she feels it. But she, mother can't soothe it, so it's amplified. Child feels it, she feels it. Plus, her feeling related to what the child is feeling. It's amplified. Now she's freaking out. She's too triggered. Her feelings come up. She absorbs the child's feelings. Now, it's, now she's got to squelch it. Now she's got to attack the child. So the child feels worse afterwards. Many adult children of borderlines uh, develop headaches after talking to them on the telephone. <laughs> uh, one about the witch here. The witch seeks a mate she can control, a blind accomplice to his wife's malice. She is drawn to passive, submissive, vulnerable, or feeble individuals. She denigrates those with power because of her fear of being controlled. Okay, we've got some quotes about the passivity of men, of the husbands. Oh yeah, here's one, here's a very popular, I don't have any quotes from Miss Linehan. This is the first quote from Miss Linehan here, but her name seems to come up a fair bit. She offers like band-aid, um, just uh, like a, a toolkit of band-aids. No psychoanalysis, no healing, nothing to help the person get better, but just a toolkit of self-help bandages. But here's one bandage that's one of the better ones, I think. Well, it is by making these individuals different in principle from ourselves that we can demean them. And perhaps at times we demean them to make them different. Once we see, however, that the principles of behavior influencing normal behavior, including our own, are the same principles influencing borderline behavior. So once we can do that, we will more easily emphasize and respond compassionately to the difficulties they present us. So it's just a question of degree. Maybe everybody's a little bit covert borderline. It's just masked over with other defense mechanisms. Maybe everybody, maybe everybody has a little bit of this. Right? Fear, of it, fear of close relationships, having exaggerated uh, extreme emotions, switching emotions. Okay, now, now let's move on to um, today's, uh, today's quotes here. Okay, so. All of that was a preparation for today. So now we're going to get into a little more of a... I wonder if I can... Um, maybe I can move 
I think that maybe, let me move over there. Hold on a second. Oh, oh, they're gonna take my spot. I was just gonna, oh, funny, I was just gonna go there. And, uh, some people just sat there. Maybe I'm um, interesting. But the problem is, I want to give this man his privacy because talking, it looks like. Well, he sat himself knowing I'm here. So, I guess it should be okay. Let me just, yeah, maybe we'll just turn around. How's that? Or, 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 hang on, hang on. Let's just switch over. Hold on a second. Does that work? Not really. Hang on a second. Or I could bring that chair and move it here. That's a thought. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Alright, let me check the how's the battery? Battery's holding up. Okay, good, good. Uh, give me just give me two minutes, one minute here. Hold on a second. Uh, stay tuned, we got some good quotes coming. Hold on a second. Or or okay, hang on, let's just move this one. this last time okay here we go drum roll please drum roll please 2790 I'm gonna do some sort of like general quotes to begin with and then we'll get into the important ones BPD can be understood in terms of the absence or impairment of the capacity for stress regulation, attentional control, and empathy, which are acquired in the context of attachment relationships. Some people have a thing called mentalization-based therapy. I, have no, I know nothing about it, what's unique about it, but mentalizing refers to the capacity of the empathy Mentalizing means empathy. Um, empathy or mentalizing refers to the capacity to understand one's own and others' mental states. So there's some sense of what they're thinking and feeling, and they're traumatized. What are they repeating? How, how do they? How maybe their P BPD is a, is a form of their PTSD? They just have some kind of recognition uh, that they, they, that they might be crying for love, that they're that they've been abused. And, and you, if you see a lot of body tension, that's pain. If they're smoking, that's tranquilizers. They're tranquilizing their pain. Mentalization-based therapy will aim to increase our capacity to uh, not lose our minds, quote-unquote, when experiencing intense emotions, but to remain mindful of ourselves and others. So just stay mindful when a lot of emotions come up, try to stay mindful, even though you're triggered, even though you're triggered, an old thing from childhood is coming up, try to stay mindful of what you're experiencing. Mothers with BPD can struggle to mentalize their baby's experience. That's sort of the, that's sort of the source point of it all. Hold on a second, now, give me another second now, hold on a second. Drum roll, please. 
Thank you. <laughs> people's people's descriptions when encountering a hysterical, volatile personality with interpersonal conflict, eccentric, etc., suggest BPD. So just in general, if, you, if people say, geez, he's hysterical, volatile, impulsive, exaggerated, flies, flies off the handle easily, a little paranoid or something, that, that implies BPD. In people with borderline psychology disorder, certain sets of schemas, known as schema modes, or internal working models, or blueprints, templates, traumatic scripts, psychic templates of working models, object relations theory, are active at a given time. And flipping between these modes is the reason that BPD clients appear so chaotic. So there's a memory network. One memory was mother shamed him. Another memory was um, mother soothed him when he was crying. Well, one minute, you can be the shaming mother. Next minute, you can feel like the victim of the one you just shamed. You can flip it around. Right? So, for example, they might shame others and instantly feel like the victim of the person they just shamed. That's, that's, the, chaos, that's the chaos of it all. Gen generally, okay, personality disorder refers to an ongoing refers to ongoing pattern patterned ways of relating to self and the world that is ineffective causes distress to oneself and refers to current aspects of the person it is not who the person is again always once again try as much as possible to to remember that there are people with this mind don't just say they're a borderline, they're a BPD, and like box them in like that. They're a human being with a mind configuration, right? Uh, with a mind configuration um, uh, that we might uh, refer to as the BPD mind. Uh, sorry, give me another second here. Hold on. Okay, drum roll, please. Thank you. <laughs> BPD is primarily a dysfunction of emotional, of the emotional regulation system, which is part of, of an interdependent set of systems involving thinking, behavior, interpersonal communication, identity, etc. All right. Similar, similar to ADHD, similar to ADHD, BPD entails severe problems with interpersonal relationships. Even though problems with impulsivity, executive functioning, and emotional regulation ability are all characteristic of ADHD and BPD. The impulsive, the impulsivity associated with BPD is riskier and more extreme. Some cases of BPD are in the quote border of bipolar disorder. That's an interesting one. 
shrinks long ago said it's schizophrenia. No, it's hysteria. Uh, no, it's, um, we don't know what it is. <laughs> this one says it's sort of in the border, inside that border that comprises the, the bipolar thing. McGuire and Troisi, 1998, point out that most of the defining items or traits of BPD, which we customarily view as simply a variety of psychopathology or dysfunction, can also be understood as indices, indices of failed efforts to achieve goals that require mother's participation. Look at that, eh? So the trait, BPD trait, here's a go. So BPD traits, BPD traits are indices, indices of failed efforts by the baby to achieve his needs, to achieve goals that require mother's participation. Mother doesn't participate properly. He ends up with BP. He may end up with BPD. BPD. Okay. Uh, we associate with it object hunger, the oral greed, fear of fusion, conflict over the experience and expression of emotional needs and anger, separation, abandonment, etc. Okay. What about terminology? There have been there have been explorations of alternative names for the collection of features that we call BPD. For example, complex PTSD. How about that one? Complex PTSD. Remember, B BPD is a type of PTSD. So why don't we call it complex PTSD? At least this acknowledges in the name the role of past trauma. Another one, emotion regulation disorder. Okay, emotional intensity disorder. Well, these highlight the central feature of heightened emotional sensitivity and reactivity. But one guy says, I cringe when I see this phrase, BPD. I don't like it. This phrase may lend itself Although this, this phrase may lend itself to speed in discussion, convenience when talking, but it also potentially moves further away from remembering that the person who demonstrates symptoms associated with borderline phenomenon may have suffered much already, including struggles to feel that they are part of, rather than other to their community. So we got to remember that those, uh, uh, on some level, don't really believe that they're a part of their community. They feel an exception, a special except other to, right? They feel different or a special exception to it all. They, they don't feel really a part of the community emotionally somehow. So labeling tends to box people so he doesn't like labels. On the other hand, we gotta talk about it somehow. Hence the limits of language, right? Especially the English language which, which is very strong in labeling things because of the verb to be, he is. English is very dependent on this, the structure very heavily on this verb to be, he is this. They are that. It is. And some languages don't even have the verb to be. In those languages, in those cultures, uh, people are more loving and more accepting and tolerant. So, in, like for example, uh, you don't say he's a you don't say he's a baker. You say uh, he's one who bakes bread. See, the language doesn't say. Some languages don't have the verb to be. In that language, they don't say. Um, like, oh, what does he do or something? They don't say, oh, he's a baker. They say, oh, no, no he's um, one, uh, a person who bakes bread. Oh, he's a person 
who breaks bread. Okay, you, you emphasize the personhoodness first. Who does the thing? See, English avoids that. Oh, he's a baker. He box him. Baker, box, image, baker, image. It, it, it tends to compartmentalize. Then you judge, then you isolate, and you fragment him. You're removing the humanness of it a little bit. But if you but if you take away the verb to be and just say he's one who bakes, what do you do? Um, let's say he's a short. Well, I'm a short seller. Well, that's pretty. That's pretty uh, clear, right? That's pretty painful. At least if we say, well, he's one who short sells. And I humanize him. He's a human being who short sells. So what's short selling? Destroy something that's good and make a quick buck. So if you just simply say he's a short seller, you immediately have a kind of negative feeling. But if you say, no, he's one who short sells. Okay, he's a person with trauma. He's a person with a pain in his heart. Or Okay, here we go. These next two, I think, is the heart, the heart of the heart of the matter, as I understand it, at this point in my understanding of the topic. It's a two-parter. Part A is from Judd and McClasshan, and Part B is from Gottstein. Here we go. Part A. Drum roll, please. Thank you. BPD. Let's think about it as internalized PTSD. Hold it, hold the phone. Meaning, the emotional dysregulation inherent in BPD may result in part from a PTSD-like generalized stress response pattern of hyper arousal and or numbing but the trigger is not a specific traumatic memory the traumatic trigger is recreated in the context of a current relationship in which closeness exposes the BPD client to actual or feared abuse in the form of emotional neglect abandonment or attack the trauma is thereby recreated and relived rather than recalled. So the PTSD is internalized, but there's no specific trigger to set it off. Just being, just in, just in relating with some, just relating triggers it off. So it's a kind of PTSD. It's a relate. That's what I said. See, I said this in the beginning. Um, that, P, that BPD seems to be like a, a relational PTSD. That's what he's. That's what he's saying here. See, this kind of validates uh, my hunch uh, from earlier. So PTSD is like a specific shock trauma, right? BPD is a PTSD, but there's no specific trigger that triggers it. The trigger is just relating. Just trying to relate. Maybe someone who bullies the conversation or dominates the conversation might be like that. Or someone who's trying to coerce you to listen to them with their uh, frozen anger in their tone that might be like that. Okay, part B. Drum roll, please. Part B. Thank you. Here we go, James Grostein. Here's an interesting one. Here's one of the best definitions of BPD right here. BPD is characterized, in my opinion, James Grostein's opinion, by the presence of a psychotic personality, organization, and a normal or neurotic personality organization which have undergone a unique interpenetration with each other so that a new amalgam emerges which can well be stated as psychotically neurotic or neurotically psychotic. It is as if occlusive symbiosis exists 
between these two twin personalities which allows for an unusual tenacity, stability and cohesion. So there's an unusual tenacity, stability and cohesion. The person, can, the person is psychotically neurotic. So they're neurotic on the surface but they're psychotic underneath. Or you can say they're neurotically psychotic. Oh brother. That's a best that's that's, 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 that's a good one. So they somehow have managed to fuse a kind of schizophrenia mind with some kind of normal mind and blurred it up, meshed it up, and created a new amalgam called the BPD mind which simultaneously is psychotic and neurotic, or neurotic and psychotic. It's very intuitive, it's hypersensitive, uh, it's stable, it's, uh, it's uh, constant in making other people feel empty or uh, confused or upset, but they're stable because they're both, uh, it's like, like take somebody from the, from the nut house and take a normal person and imagine imagine the mind of those two somehow uh, in the science fiction zoop out the mind of the normal person zoop out the mind of the psychotic person put those two minds into some kind of bowl uh, twir stir the bowl around or something sprinkle in some something I don't know and create some new entity, some new, some new uh, synthesis of it all, and yeah, now you have a new mind that comprises of those two minds. Now I don't know if this is, now I don't know which came first. There's another quote by Grostein. He says, "Take the narcissistic mind and the bully mind and fuse them." This one's a variation. He says, "Take a normal mind." And a, and a schizophrenic mind infused them. That's why, you, you, that's why, you, if you had the experience of talking to somebody uh, with this, uh, they don't look, they don't look like um, they're schizophrenic. They seem, they make it sound like they're normal, or they look normal. But if you like, wait a minute, if you hit the pause button here, oh my God, this is schizophrenic. But they're neurotic about it, so they're psychotically neurotic, or the other way around. Neurotically psychotic. <laughs> How was that second one? I, I get the first one, I get psychotically neurotic. How do you imagine neurotically psychotic? They look neurotic, but they're being psychotic. The first one... No, no. Hold on. <laughs> psychotically neurotic. They sell their psychosis with neurosis. So they get away with that way, right? Or... Neurotically psychotic. Or they sell their neurosis by being psychotic. So on the surface, you might think they're psychotic. Um, but underneath, you might think, wait a minute, maybe they're neurotic. Maybe they're more normal. But they sound, they sound schizophrenic. Maybe there's normal underneath it. Yeah, okay, maybe like that, right? So maybe your first impression is, oh, gee, they belong in the nut house. But you listen carefully, I don't know, maybe there's some normalcy in there somehow. So you're confused like that. Or the other way, um, they sound uh, normal, but you listen carefully and they belong in the nut house. Yeah, put it that way. So your first impression is they belong in the nut house, but you listen carefully, oh wait a minute, maybe they're okay. The other way, they sound okay, but you listen carefully and you think they belong in the nut house. 
<laughs> that story we talked about, the unicorn, the uh, Thur James Thurber's 1931 story, the unicorn in the garden, uh, that was about the nuthouse thing. Okay, a couple more here to round this up. BPD causes problems in four main areas. Intensely varying mood. So that, that's the soap opera hysterics, right? S significant difficulties in relationships which tend to be stormy or non-existent. Stony silence with, or, or the soap opera stuff. Destructive acting out. Okay, now they're throwing dishes around or whatever. And a poorly developed sense of identity, reflecting a lack of integration, reflecting, reflecting a lack of integration of different parts of the self, including a split between good and bad parts. That's so splitting mechanism. So the, the splitting mechanism, acting out, dramatic acting out, intensity of mood swings, and the soap opera. All right, next one. Liotti compares the BPD, quote, contradictory and non-integrated representation stemming from the disorganized internal working model to the three basic roles of the drama triangle, the Carpman triangle. So, okay, so remember the Carpman triangle from the 60s, 1968, the famous Carpman triangle? Right. So in so the in relationships, the three roles, the three main roles, right? You got the powerless victim, um, hurt by the by the persecutor, and then somebody comes in as the rescuer. And these three roles on the triangle: rescuer, persecutor, victim. It, it can move around the triangle. Right? Imagine that moving around of the Carpman Triangle in somebody's brain. One minute he's the victim, now he's the rescuer, now he's the persecutor. While he's the per persecutor, he feels like the rescuer, thinks you're the victim. Now he feels like the victim. Now you're the rescuer. He feels that he's the rescuer. No, now he admits he's, he's the persecutor. No, you're the persecutor. So you're flipping the three rolls around with yourself and the others, and you're flipping it all around. That's not, that's not too bad, right? That's sort of like a self-healthy kind of thing. Okay, now, here, I like this, I kind of like this one here. Here's a thought-provoking one. Some people might say, well, wait a minute, the BPD, if they're all over the place, that's paradox, right? Oh, no. There's a difference between seeing the two sides of the story to, to feel whole versus nothing there, nothing there, and you feel empty. The borderline person's neither yes nor no rarely has the fluidity of paradox, but instead is a caricature. It's a cartoon caricature of it, leaving one empty and confused rather than whole. Yeah. So don't think there's some kind of like a some Zen master, Buddhist master, or something like that, who, who understands the two sides and you feel more whole. Um, it's, a, it's a mockery of it. The BPD is a mockery of the genuine, uh, you know, Tai Chi master or something like that, right? Okay, last one here. Individual therapy. So just in general, on a positive note here, therapy focuses on understanding how your behaviors make sense. how they're your best way of coping that you currently know of and validating and affirming your struggles. I see your struggle kind of thing, right? So given what you've been through, it makes sense uh, what, you're, what you're doing. And, and given, given what you've been through, it makes sense and I see your struggle. Let's see. Five o'clock. Okay.
Okay, five o'clock. We've got an hour of light left. But no, an hour and a half, actually. Should I just leave it? Should I just leave it like this? Or let's go for a little. Either I wrap it up here or go for a little walk. Let's see. It's Saturday, so it's kind of busy. If I visit the nearby hotels a little bit, I probably won't be able to have a quiet spot. Right? It's too bad there's no park like I can walk around. around here. Other than this spot here. Yeah, let's walk around here. Our theme song to 1001 Windmills of the Mind is Katja Epstein's German cover of the song Windmills of the Mind. Great song. A very good English cover of the song is the one done by Barbara Lewis. Yeah, the one about the, the Velveteen Rabbit story. So imagine, yeah, here's the rabbit, right? We're getting it on here. So I'm at, oh, hang on. So imagine, um, imagine the Velveteen Rabbit talking to these two, two guys here. Hey, rabbits. So imagine a stuffed rabbit, a velveteen rabbit, talking to these two guys here. Hey, hey, hey rabbit, what, what's it like to feel real? You know, I, I'm a stuffed rabbit here, I don't feel real. You guys are real. Can you please tell me, what does it feel? What does it feel like to be real? I want to be real. What's it like to be real? I want to feel real. And, and here's our stone rabbit over here. Velveteen rabbit. Oh. oh, hi there. <laughs> here's our here's our stone rabbit. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> go down here. Oh, you got a big party coming in. Yeah. Big party, yeah. Yeah, they got a big party. A lot of a lot of our reserves. Huh? There's the, the one with the orange beak here, yeah. Oh, well, they, they, they both got orange beak. What am I talking about?
Awesome birds, they're awesome birds. Understanding, empathy, right? Understanding, empathy, right? These quotes promote understanding, which leads to empathy. On that note, I'll see you in 2791. We'll do another batch of quotes on the BPD uh, phenomena. Yeah, it's a relational PTSD with no specific trigger like we see with Pete, regular PTSD. It's just the act of relating that triggers that all up. And the PTSD volatility and, and fears and push-pull and dramatics and survival anxiety, that's, that's about relationships. That implies that the baby and the mother had a real struggle, that the baby and the mother were fighting all the time and a lot of pain for the poor baby like that, just sort of continuation like that. Okay, I'll see you. In, I'll see you in the next video. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, to be to be continued.